Scotland and Northern Ireland, again, staying fairly blustery. For the south, most of the night dry, but notice cloud and rain thickening up once more in the southwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere, again, a bit of a chilly one. Where skies do stay clear, we'll be down into single figures. Misty murky then for some in the morning with some fog around, and the rain and drizzle will become more extensive across the south through the day. At the same time, rain is edging in from the north. So a bit of a mishmash tomorrow. Some slices of northern England, north Wales, may stay dry and bright through the day, but elsewhere expect some cloud and rain and temperatures a little bit lower, particularly across northern areas, particularly for Scotland, with the very frequent showers coming in here and very blustery conditions too. A band of wet weather will continue to sink southwards. The rain should ebb away on Friday evening across the Midlands and East Anglia too, leading to many places having a bright start to the weekend. There will be sunny spells on both Saturday and Sunday, but expect showers and a fairly brisk breeze as well. Bye for now. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello and a very warm welcome to GB Newsday with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. Is there another major U-turn in the pipeline list? Truss's premiership is only a few weeks old, but the government is already being warned by its own MPs to rethink its tax-cutting plans and stabilise the markets and the economy. Well, those warnings coming with uh, a bruising appearance of the Prime Minister in front of Tory backbenchers. Uh, could her time as Prime Minister be coming to an end? And another health crisis. The latest figures showing the waiting list for hospital treatment hitting a record high 7 million people in England. Hospitals are carrying out 12% fewer operations and treatments than before the pandemic. We'll be getting the latest on the health of our health service. And the campaigning group Asylum Aid, bringing a new challenge to the government's plans to send more asylum seekers on flights to Rwanda. This is the hotel in Rwanda where they may end up. Swella Bravman, the new Home Secretary, said to want to expand that policy. But will the courts mean her plans stay grounded? We'll have the latest. And please, as ever, do get in touch. We love hearing from you. It's gbviews at gbnews.uk. We'll be reading out some of your thoughts throughout the show. First, though, time for the latest news headlines. One minute past 12. I'm Ray Addison in the GB newsroom. Some Tory backbenchers are urging the Prime Minister to abandon her tax-cutting plans unveiled last month. 
Last night, Liz Truss came under pressure from Conservative MPs at a meeting of the 1922 committee. It comes just days after the Bank of England intervened for a second time with an emergency support package. It's warned that pension fund managers have until tomorrow to finish rebalancing their books. However, Head of Retirement Policy at AJ Bell, Tom Shelby, told GB News most pensioners have nothing to worry about. And one of the key messages that I've been trying to get across over the past kind of 48 hours is reassuring people that what is happening at the moment with the Bank of England and the gilt market will have almost no impact on the vast majority of people's pensions. So I've been speaking to people who are concerned about the state pension, they're concerned about their investments, they're concerned that they're not going to get any pension at all. Actually, what the Bank of England is trying to do here is stabilise bond prices. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel. However, critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record. The newest challenge brought by Asylum Aid will argue against the speed of the removal process and the lack of information given to those affected. Around £4.5 billion awarded as part of the COVID-19 furlough scheme was lost through mistakes and fraudulent claims, a public spending watchdog has warned. The National Audit Office is criticising the government for not doing enough when it rolled out the scheme, which cost an overall £97 billion. However, it does say the scheme met its primary objective of protecting workers and businesses. A government spokesperson says they're still working to root out those who abused the system, with £1.1 billion expected to be recovered by the HMRC over the next two years. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting to start treatment at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. The number of people waiting more than a year has hit a total of more than 387,000. Royal Mail workers are striking today in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers' Union says 115,000 members are joining picket lines outside Royal Mail offices. It's one of a series of 19 walkouts planned against various proposals by the company. Royal Mail says that the union's action is weakening their financial position. However, the CWU's General Secretary says that Royal Mail's planned changes will not improve the service. It's not about modernisation. Uh, in fact, it's insulting the intelligence of all postal workers and I think the public and businesses to suggest it's anything other than uh, an asset stripping business plan and a levelling down agenda. And frankly, we're not going to support that. Detectives looking for a woman missing for three years have launched a murder inquiry after finding human remains. 19-year-old Leah Croucher was last seen on CCTV as she walked to work in Milton Keynes in February 2019. Thames Valley Police are searching a property where items belonging to her, including a rucksack, have been found following a tip-off from a member of the public. It says specialist teams will remain there for a significant period of time. And the Metropolitan Police will start using data to predict which men in London might be violent towards women and girls. The Met Commissioner says the force is working with a data network of men in the capital to forecast who could commit violent crimes against the opposite sex. Sir Mark Rowley told a police conference he wants to use the information based on previous behaviour to stop offenders before they can offend. Meanwhile, the force has announced it's currently investigating more than 600 sexual and domestic abuse allegations against its own officers. You're watching GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Back now to Mark and Gloria.
So, welcome to GB Newsday. As the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, comes under increasing pressure from her own MPs. They're demanding more U-turns on her tax-slashing agenda after she ruled out spending cuts to balance the books. Speculation is growing within Westminster that she could be forced out of office by her own MPs if she doesn't change course. However, an ally of Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley, has said that any attempt to replace her as Prime Minister would be a disastrously bad idea and that she deserves support to push through the government's economic growth plan. Well, let's speak now to our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who has uh, the latest for us. And, uh, Tom, the indications are this charm offensive that she tried with the 1922 committee, all the backbenchers, well, just didn't charm them. Certainly, it's hard to overstate the uh, real trouble within the Conservative Party as things stand. A deeply divided party, divided against itself. There are those on the back benches who didn't back Liz Truss in the first place, who uh, disagree with the election result of the membership, who think now is not the right time to cut taxes, and who have been trying to really stick a, uh, a stick in the gears uh, throughout this process. However, there are others around Liz Truss who think that really the behaviour of those on the back benches hasn't given her plan a chance to get going, hasn't given it the time it needs to work. And there you have this uh, intractable mess between different factions, warring factions even, within the Conservative Party. That meeting last night of the 1922 committee in committee room 14 of the building behind me was meant to be held in private behind those thick wooden doors of that committee corridor. However, just about everything that was said in that meeting quickly leaked out to the press afterwards. We know, of course, that uh, Robert Halfen, a senior backbench uh, member of parliament, of course, the chair of the Education Select Committee, accused this government of abandoning the good work of the last uh, decade or so, abandoning blue-collar conservatism even. And there were even stronger words from anonymous MPs that have since leaked out too. It's a pretty torrid time for the Tory party. However, of course, we are expecting more to come over the coming weeks. The 31st is that big date for the fiscal statement from the Chancellor, that mid-term plan, and crucially, the Office of Budget Responsibilities assessment as well. Now, the Prime Minister's spokesman this morning in our daily lobby briefing has said that the Prime Minister has complete faith in the Office for Budget Responsibility, uh, almost slapping down some of the question marks that the Business Secretary raised about the uh, record of the OBR in the past last night. No, the Prime Minister sticking to it, saying that this is the uh, audit body, if you will, for the government, the one that the government is sticking to and the government and indeed the world has faith in. Another crucial point to come out of today's lobby briefing was the matter of whether or not the government would row back at all on the measures within its mini-budget announced now just around three weeks ago. Of course, already one measure uh, there was a fairly spectacular U-turn on, the 45p rate of tax. That uh, reduced to 45p. That plan was was abandoned pretty spectacularly, pretty dramatically on the first night of Conservative Party conference. But the Prime Minister's spokesman today being incredibly strident that there'll be no further backsliding, that there'll be no more U-turns, that there won't even be a delay to implementation of the elements of this package, what they call the growth plan, what others call the mini budget. The message from number 10, certainly this morning, is that on the remaining measures of the mini-budget, the Prime Minister is sticking firm. I suppose the question is, how long will that position be able to stick firm? The Prime Minister has demonstrated that she has U-turned uh, once. Now it's uh, the backbenchers of the Conservative Party who smell blood. They'll try and force her to U-turn again. But the message from Number 10, very clear, they don't want to. Can she get all those measures that she says she's adamant about pushing through, can she get them through Parliament? Well, I think certainly on the biggest measures, one was already voted on. Two nights ago, that uh, national insurance increase reversal, that has now passed its second reading of the House of Commons. So already on one element of the mini-budget, the government has passed that. Certainly on the largest measure, of the mini-budget as well, peculiarly for such a huge, unfunded spending commitment, almost or up to £150 billion of spending 
is perhaps the least controversial bit of this mini budget, peculiarly that has support from across the House, so that will certainly pass as well. There are other elements of this mini budget that seem to carry support as well. For example, the reduction in the basic rate of tax. The Labour Party has said they support that element as well. That costs around £5 billion bringing that forward to this year. So on the vast bulk of the package, actually, there's cross-party agreement as things stand. It's only on around £20 billion or so that the Labour Party is opposing. What, what is that? Well, that is the uh, corporation tax maintenance, I should say, not a cut, of course, but keeping it at the level it is rather than following the Rishi Sunak plan to raise it. That is one element. And then there's some other little bits, the changes to what's called IR35 uh, tax rules and also stamp duty, that reduction uh, and raising of the threshold to eliminate stamp duty for people buying their first home uh, up to, I think, 500,000 Pounds. Now, those are the smaller elements of the uh, fiscal statement. However, they're also some of the most contentious. And we could enter this peculiar world where actually Conservative MPs force the government to U-turn on some elements that even the Labour Party supports. We really are through the looking glass when it comes to so many elements of this mini-budget. We'll speak to you later in the show, Tom. Thank you for the update. Well, let's stay with the politics because the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda being challenged in the High Court today by the campaign group Asylum Aid. Home Secretary Suella Braverman says she's committed to the policy to process asylum seekers in Rwanda. She came under fire at the party conference when she said it was her dream to send asylum seekers there. But there are now reports of a row between Prime Minister Liz Truss and the Home Secretary over immigration policy. The Prime Minister, of course, wants to relax visa rules as part of that push for growth. Let's get the latest now with uh, Catherine Foster, who's been following events at the High Court. Um, what have they been outlining on the, on the legal front there, Catherine? Yes, so this is a two-day hearing that began at half past ten this morning. It's expected to go till the middle of tomorrow afternoon. Another legal challenge to the government's plan to send some people who cross the channel on small boats illegally on a one-way ticket to Rwanda in Africa. Um, so today, two judges and the Ch Asylum Aid, the charity bringing the case, represented by Charlotte Kilroy, KC. She has said that the government's plans are inherently unlawful and unfair, and bringing in a couple of specific reasons why they dispute the government's assertion that Rwanda is a safe country. Also, they take issue with the speed at which this is proposed to go through. They're saying that people won't have enough time before they are potentially deported to make their argument and things like they should be seen by a GP within 24 hours, etc. That often isn't happening. Also, they're saying that they're not given enough information at the point at which it is needed. I should say it got off to a fairly bumpy start for the charity because the judges um, said that it turned out that of the 42 claimants being represented, 20 of them all had, in fact, managed to submit appeals. So one of the judges said, have we been misled? What else haven't we been told? We've been given partial information late in the day and only at the request of the court. So suggested that um, Charlotte Kilroy would go back and look over that information overnight. But certainly, of course, not a single person has yet been sent to Rwanda. Priti Pratel, the former Home Secretary, announced this plan in April. The thinking was it would deter people from making this very dangerous journey. If the message was you are likely to end up in Rwanda, you will not be granted asylum, it would deter people from coming. Now, the legal challenges that kicked off immediately after that were won by the government here in the UK courts, but it was eventually blocked in Europe by the European Court of Human Rights. And so the flight that was originally scheduled to take off on June the 14th, of course, had fewer and fewer people on board to the point that eventually everyone was removed 
from that flight and nobody went to Rwanda at all. But the government is desperate to deal with this problem. Of course, part of the Brexit referendum, they promised, you know, control of our borders. Now, back in 2016, there was no real problem with small boats crossing the channel. This is a fairly recent thing. But the numbers have gone up and up and up. It was something like the government only started keeping records in 2018. There were 299. The next year went up to sort of just under 2,000. 2020, eight and a half thousand. 2021, nearly 29,000. But this year already, bearing in mind we're only in mid-October, over 35 and a half thousand people have crossed the channel on small boats, and this is putting massive pressures on resources in the southeast of England and especially Kent at a time of a cost of living crisis. Also, there is a massive backlog of, I think, 118,000 cases within the asylum system that are yet to be processed. And of course, all of these people need feeding, need looking after, need legal advice, need care. And so the government is determined to press ahead with the plan to send people to Rwanda, but how and when this may happen remains very unclear. And there are reports, Catherine, of a rift emerging between the Home Secretary's position on immigration and the Prime Minister's. Just to explain a little bit about those reports, if you would. Yes, so it's not just uh, illegal immigration that is at issue. Um, Suella Braverman, the new Home Secretary, has made it known that she wants immigration to get back to the tens of thousands. That was, of course, a pledge from David Cameron later abandoned. Now, the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, has made noises to the effect that she is prepared to see more immigration to relieve some of the skills shortages. Obviously, we have a very tight jobs market. She is keen that those vacancies are filled. If they if they want growth, getting people doing the jobs that need doing is an essential part of that. So there is certainly a tension there and it will be fascinating to see how it is resolved. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. We'll speak to you later in the show. Well, let's stay on that particular row. Uh, number three by my account, uh, only 18 minutes into the programme. Uh, let's get the views now. Stephen Wolfe, who's director of the Centre for Migration and uh, Economic Prosperity. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, this, uh, in detail, is a bit of a spat with the uh, Indian uh, government on Indian migration. But, of course, there is a, a wider issue here about whether, in fact, migration is a, a net benefit to an economy to help with growth. There is indeed. And uh, there are two basic arguments. The one that's really preferred by the Treasury in particular is that by allowing as many people into the country, it creates growth through the term gross domestic product, GDP. And they like to see that because they then are able to say that we can increase taxes by having people working. But if you listen to Jacob Rees-Mogg, those on his wing of the Conservative Party and those economists who don't really like the idea of immigration being linked solely to GDP will po point to the fact that there is another definition, um, uh, which is basically gross domestic product per person, uh, which is like, how do you divide the gross domestic product by the number of people in the country? And when you look at that, you often see that the wealth of individuals in the country actually decline. And that's why you see the cost of increases to hospitals, in schools, infrastructure and the taxation levels that are supposed to come through from GDP rises don't really affect uh, all the country and in particularly the poorest areas of the country, the city centres which receive most of the immigration that you're perhaps seeing from the channel migrants coming in, all those who are coming in to work in low-skilled areas, they're the ones who get impacted the worst. I just want to ask you a question on small boats. Um, everybody would agree nobody wants to see people risking their lives uh, making these uh, terrible journeys uh, in search of a better life. The government have announced several initiatives uh, and the taxpayers paid millions of pounds to try and stop it happening. Nothing seems to be working. What should be done? 
Well, you're quite right. First of all, if you look at this case, the Rwanda uh, process that's been challenged in the court today, and we've been watching this now since August and September, is key if you really want to put a proper deterrent in for the people smugglers who really are, are pushing people across as best they can now and as quickly as they can in order to avoid any potential that their clients will be removed to Rwanda. And it's recognised as being a, a reasonable deterrent. Why is it done so? Otherwise, you wouldn't have had three attempts, or well, not really attempts, they are actually three cases of the immigration industry challenging the government in the courts. But if you look at the background of this, you can see that Denmark is considering using this option for Rwanda too. There are other countries that are looking at, at putting their asylum applications across to African nations as well. And they do so because of the cost, the huge cost to their own uh, exchequers. If you look at housing costs here in the UK, it's £5.2 million a day in addition to the big deals that they do. So Rwanda policy has to work. And then I think the government's going to need to consider other options of immediately taking people out of the UK somewhere else so that they can have perhaps huge camps like the Australians planned originally to have on the island so that they can do the assess assessment there. You need something to remove the excessive cost from the UK and put it in to a lower cost area. Stephen Wolfe, Director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. Thanks for your thoughts today. My pleasure. Uh, coming up, the Prince and Princess of Wales to visit the Copper Box Arena in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, all to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Core Coach. What's that? We'll be finding out. First, though, weather details for you. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Most of us having a fine October day today, but there are one or two exceptions across the far south. A lot of cloud and some outbreaks of rain and turning wet and windy in the northwest too. That is because of this weather system and it's in the south. Uh, because of this weather system that we're keeping a lot of cloud, mist and murk. But most of the country between those two weather systems, dry and fine. Plenty of sunshine across southern and eastern Scotland, the eastern side of Northern Ireland, northern England, much of Wales and the Midlands. And even in the south, actually turning a bit drier across the southwest and the rain and drizzle easing across the south coast too. But staying fairly cloudy in the southeast, some rain coming into western Scotland and Northern Ireland and the breeze picking up in the northwest too. Temperatures generally in the mid-teens, feeling pretty pleasant in that October sunshine if you've got it. Now we will see a bit more of that rain spreading through the central belt during this evening and then down into southern Scotland. Another band of rain then follows on behind across northern Scotland and Northern Ireland, again staying fairly blustery. For the south, most of the night dry, but notice Cloud and rain thickening up once more in the southwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere, again, a bit of a chilly one. Where skies do stay clear, we'll be down into single figures. Misty murky then for some in the morning with some fog around. And the rain and drizzle will become more extensive across the south through the day. At the same time, rain is edging in from the north. So a bit of a mishmash tomorrow. Some slices of northern England, north Wales, may stay dry and bright through the day, but elsewhere expect some cloud and rain and temperatures a little bit lower, particularly across northern areas, particularly for Scotland, with the very frequent showers coming in here and fairly blustery conditions too. A band of wet weather will continue to sink southwards. The rain should ebb away on Friday evening across the Midlands and East Anglia too, leading to many places having a bright start to the weekend. There will be sunny spells on both Saturday and Sunday, but expect showers and a fairly brisk breeze as well. Bye for now. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. 
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. And welcome back to GB Newsday, where the Prince and Princess of Wales will be visiting the Copper Box Arena, no less, in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London. William and Kate will be at an event to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Core Coach. That's a programme launched in 2012 in response to the London riots and to contribute to the legacy ideals of the 2012 London Olympics and Paralympic Games. Well, let's uh, cross live to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and Rosie Wright is waiting for us uh, there uh, with, as we say, a bit of legacy, Rosie. Yeah, and lots of people waiting with real excitement. The event kicks off in about an hour's time. And the arena behind me, the Copper Box, which you'll remember from the Olympics 10 years ago, was home to things like handball and fencing. Today, Core Coach are going to be putting on a, a real showcase of the work that they do and do that for the Prince and Princess of Wales. Renee is one of Core Coach's ambassadors. And also, uh, you were trained up by the organisation. Just to explain what impact that's had and how it's changed the trajectory of your young adult life of course uh coach Gore have had this impact on young people where they give them a safe space they allow them to use their youth voice again a lot of the time young people are probably shun out for using their voice a lot of the ways that we know young people might be a bit more focused around going down the wrong path making mistakes and not learning from them however coach Gore gives you a space to do that with free space again and free time as well so you were trained up so that you could teach other people how to do sport so what's your job now it changes day to day, it absolutely changes. So from working with young people, again, around school ages, so that 11 to 16 age, as well as in the evening, going and doing an evening session, probably got refugees, young people who are coming over to the session, trying to stay off the street. We have a walking football session. It varies all the time, it varies. So Renee's from Birmingham, when you just said now, you've hardly ever been to London. So ever been. welcome to Stratford, Thank home you. of the Olympics. <laughs> One really key thing about the Olympics was making sure there was gonna be a legacy that extended beyond it. What are kind of your memories of watching the Olympics 10 years ago? You would only been about 10. About that age, yeah. I remember a lot of the stuff on TV going around in school. We made a massive fuss about it in the community. Uh, we had some sort of mini games going on at local parks, community centres. But my main memory was the fact that someone like Jessica Ennis, who came from, again, hardship and the background that she did, she was able to go through the heptathlon with flying colours, and that really inspired me. Yeah, and to be excel at so many different versions of sport. 100%. All sorts. I think it's uh, good to be a uh, jack of all trades. But again, when you put it to the physicality side, you've got to be a supermodel to go for that. <laughs> well, talking of supermodels, you're going to meet some, well, I guess we can call them celebrities, the royals. They're going to be arriving. The Prince and Princess of Wales. Everybody's getting uh, more familiar with their new titles now. What does it mean for you and for the organisation to have support from people who've said, actually, for young people and their mental health, we're really going to prioritise this? It's created an opportunity for us to push open doors that we didn't know were there to be opened. A lot of young people who uh, have the capacity to make the difference in the community don't feel like they're resourced often, uh, they feel like they're underrepresented. However, events like this just go to prove how much acknowledgement there is for young people with those kind of hopes and dreams. So yeah, it opens those doors and again, I'm one of the people who benefited from that, so proud. And the Royals are going to be doing some sports. What might we see them get up to? Well, the Aston Villa Foundation are obviously here to do football. We've got another organisation here doing some boxing where some apprentices have done their placement there. And we've got some young people who have been working with people living with disabilities uh, in activities like boccia, bowls and some small-sided games as well. 
Renee, thank you very much for talking to me. You are totally inspirational. <laughs> One of over 700 people who've been trained up as apprenticeships as part of the, the legacy of the Olympics 10 years ago to make sure that young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds can teach others some of the brilliance and excellence we see in sport. Rosie, thanks very much. We can see that uh, crowd gathering behind being very patient as soon as, of course, the uh, Royals are live. Uh, we'll be back to you uh, to catch up with the latest there. Coming up, we'll be speaking to Conservative MP Lee Anderson after Liz Truss faced intense pressure to reverse the measures announced in the mini-budget. Before that, it's the latest news with Ray. It's 12.31. Here's the latest from the GP newsroom. Some Tory backbenchers are urging the Prime Minister to abandon her tax-cutting plans unveiled last month. Last night, Liz Truss came under pressure from Conservative MPs at a meeting of the 1922 committee. It comes just days after the Bank of England intervened for a second time with an emergency support package. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel, but critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record. The charity Asylum Aid, who have brought the challenge, are arguing that tight timescales are leading to unfairness and impacting people's ability to access justice. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting to start treatment at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. Royal Mail workers are striking today in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers' Union says 115,000 members are joining picket lines outside of Royal Mail offices. It's the first of 19 walkouts planned for coming months. Royal Mail says industrial action is weakening the financial position of the company. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Mark and Gloria will be back in just a moment. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.
So let's bring you the latest on this fevered political atmosphere at Westminster. Allies of Liz Truss now trying to rally round the Prime Minister after coming under intense pressure from her own MPs to abandon her economic plans following the market backlash to a uh, backlash really to those measures. We can now speak to Conservative MP for Ashfield, Lee Anderson. Lee, thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, we do appreciate your time. You voted for Liz Truss to be your leader. Was it all you dreamed it would be? Well, it's been a bumpy start, Gloria. That's, uh, there's no denying that. But I'm seeing the media reports this morning. I saw the media reports last night. My phone was pinging from reporters about this hostile 22 committee meeting that we, uh, we went to last night. Look, I was at that meeting. It was anything but hostile. I think the media trying to cause a bit of a stir again. Yes, colleagues raised uh, relevant questions, challenging questions to the Prime Minister. She answered them pretty well, I think. She said she's prepared to listen to all of us. She's going to have us in over the next few weeks to listen to us all before any big decisions are made. I think that's the right thing to do. Look, I'm not getting my pitch forecast. I think the media... Uh, still walking around with the with the chest pumped out, thinking they've got what you know they've had their hand in getting rid of one prime minister, and now they you know they're, they're out again already, uh, trying to have a go at the current prime minister. I think this is not the time to start having these arguments. I think we should get behind her and give her time to settle into the roles. Tr trouble is, it wasn't the media. It was a senior Tory MP, Robert Halfon, who said trashing ten years of Tory blue collar policies. Yeah, I think the, the language that Robert was a little bit colourful, but he, had, he made a point, uh, and that's up to Robert to make that point. That was one MP. You know, there's, there's about 360 of us. One MP making making that point, which is which is up to Robert. He made some good points as well. Um, I mean, I was in the room. I, I, I witnessed, uh, and nobody's talking about the other questions uh, which were put to the Prime Minister, which he answered really, really well. I think he's just picking up uh, on, on one comment from a couple of people. Oh, by the way, let's be honest, some of these people that were making comments didn't actually back Liz to start off with, but we should get behind the leader now. You know, we've had the ballot, we've got the result, we've got a new Prime Minister. Get behind it, give a chance to settle in. Yes, there's going to be a few bumps in the road as she settles into the role, but we can't keep swapping Prime Ministers every five minutes. Yeah, fair enough. Um, on terms of the budget and the fallout from that budget, obviously we have um, another economic statement uh, in a couple of weeks. She's coming under pressure from some quarters to you turn on some of the measures in that. She could do that, it would be embarrassing, but the alternative to plough on regardless might have more uh, dangerous, catastrophic consequences for, for all of us, actually. What, what do you think she should do if, if you were advising well, her? As, I, as I'm sure she... You do. I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to be advising... Uh... The Prime Minister on economic policy, but what I would say is any policy has got to be fair. It's got to be fair to everybody in the country. Look, we made the decision to change the, uh, we, you know, we, we backtracked on the 40% um, income tax cut. That, that was the right thing to do. We all knew that. We're, you know, nobody was asking me in my inbox on 150 grand a year to, to cut their income tax. Far from it. We have to be seen as a fair and caring government. And look, you know, over the past two or three years, this government has wrapped its arms around the businesses and people of this country. We seem to forget now what we went through with COVID, about the 11 million jobs that we uh, we saved through furlough and the hundreds of thousands of businesses. You know, people tend to forget the good work we've done. They always look forward. And rightly so, we should be looking forward. And Liz always said that when she became, if she became PM, that she would introduce a budget straight away to help the most vulnerable. And I think what people actually did, led by the media just a few weeks back, they actually ignored 90%, 95% of that mini budget, which was which was good stuff to help people with their energy and, and their and their soaring bills through this winter. So let's get behind it. Uh, Lee, you would have no doubt spoken to people when you left that committee room and you got into the corridors and, and people have a gossip and so on. Is there any suggestion or, or discussion of Liz Truss actually dumping quasi Quateng to save the government? Because clearly, if there is another major backtrack on tax policy, it puts the chance in a really difficult position. Well, it does, but, you know, you don't become a bad chancellor overnight, like you don't become a good chancellor overnight. I think, you know, because it's the same as this, you've got to give them a chance to, to get into the role. But, yeah, we have, yeah, they've admitted they've made a few mistakes and listen, but, they've, you know, admitting that you, you've made a mistake in changing policy is not a sign of weakness, that's a sign of strength, you know. If you admit you've got it wrong, you hold your hands up um, and move on. And that's what they've done. But what we can't do is keep making mistakes. <laughs> Nice to your colleagues who are speaking out. It's um, a bit of a free for all, isn't it? They're crit not from all your MPs. I completely accept that argument. But there's a few too many um, expressing their criticisms in 
public rather than in private, which is the sort of best thing for discipline, isn't it? Just express your concerns yeah. um, in a private room, not on the telly or even in the chamber of the House of Commons. Well, we should do it in private, but, but, you know, like last night, Glory, you know, we had the 22 meeting, but that was in private, allegedly. I know we've got the media outside with the glasses up to the wall. That always happens. But I think the media will make their own mind up. Whatever we say in a private room, they'll, they'll, they'll say some unnamed source has said this. I think, you know, a lot of the public actually get it now. They know that uh, they're staring the pot a little bit. Um, I would advise anybody... Uh, watching this program now to stop, you know, stop actually paying much attention to the media at the moment. Apart from GB News, that is, who always tend to be balanced. Uh, but no, seriously, I think you know people will make their own mind up. I think the media have been a little bit, a um, little bit naughty at the moment. They're trying to steer it up. They seem to have the tails in the air. They think they can dictate who's going to run this country. And actually, it's the great British people that uh, decide who runs this country. They'll, they'll make their own mind up. Lee Anderson, thanks for being a bit naughty with us once more. We hope it didn't stir the pot too much. Thanks very much for your time. Cheers. Yes, all right. <laughs> uh, well, let's stir the pot a bit more. Uh, the <laughs> governor of the Bank of England, even, yeah. Uh, Andrew Bailey, he has said that spot for troubled pension funds will end as scheduled on Friday, sparking a sharp drop in the pound. Now, remember that the uh, bank originally intervened after the mini-budget, creating concern over uh, government borrowing, or at least uh, the uh, unfunded, as they say, tax cuts, but also being reported that markets punishing Britain more than Europe uh, despite debt levels here being lower than in comparable economies and historically better track record, indeed, of managing our costs. Joining us from Amsterdam, um, he will explain why. To give his expert analysis is our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan. It's all right for some, isn't it, Liam? You are in, in Amsterdam. Um, but we still need your wisdom, even from afar. Liz Truss has a choice now. She is under pressure from some quarters to change course when she has that next economic statement, when Kwasi Kwarteng delivers that next economic statement. That would be embarrassing, but is, is, is the idea or the alternative of not changing course more dangerous? Thank you, Gloria. I should just explain. I am in Amsterdam, the city of canals. I'm here actually at an annual conference covering Bitcoin, of course, one of the world's, if not the world's leading cryptocurrency. Myself and Nigel Farage will be talking on his show later this evening about Bitcoin. It's a very interesting uh, conference with lots going on here. Uh, but for now, let me just talk about Liz Truss, as, as you say. I do think she'll change course, Gloria. And I think the financial markets have just concluded that she's going to change course. While I, while I was waiting to talk to you and Mark and our GB News audience, I've been watching the 10-year gilt yield, the main benchmark of government borrowing costs, the borrowing cost that really lays the foundation, the base of the financial pyramid from which mortgage rates, personal loan rates come. And that gilt yield has fallen quite dramatically so far today from about 4.4% to 4%, which is a very, very steep drop. And the pound has gone up by about a cent from $1.11 to $1.12. So that suggests to me that the political traffic, the political noise is so potent now that the markets are concluding that Liz Truss will yield. She will abandon some of those tax cuts, which did spook the market. They were very badly uh, communicated, in, in my view. And that will be embarrassing for her. The question for her is if she can survive these big changes. I think Lee Anderson was right. That 1922 committee meeting last night wasn't nearly as bad tempered as far as I know. And I've talked to several Tory MPs this morning while on my travels as it was reported. But this is, you know, the Prime Minister, she's almost in a kind of doom loop. If she yields to her critics within her own party, then she looks weaker and her political opponents within her own party, and there are many, they'll then send blood. But um, the other doom loop when we were talking about the Bank of England and, and the markets and they, they had this 65 billion they were going to spend, that uh, we are being told most definitely will end tomorrow by uh, the, the governor of the Bank of England. Is it the case that perhaps calling the markets bluff, or at least the pension funds, means that uh, this is why these yields have fallen a little bit today? I think the yields have fallen also, Mark. I think you're right, because 
whatever the Bank of England governor says, I think the markets are assuming that that it help will extend beyond Friday. I always thought it was ill-judged. I said at the time for the Bank of England to set a line in the sand where have an upper limit of £65 billion pounds of money to intervene. We're only going to intervene until Friday. I think that really can make the markets more aggressive. It can make them think, well, how far can we push the Bank of England? It may be that these gilt yields are falling almost to spook the Bank of England. If they then don't deliver on more assistance for the gilt market, then you'll get a spike up in gilts and borrowing costs across the economy. I should say, though, Mark, you mentioned in the introduction, is the UK being reported in a different way from a lot of other advanced countries? I really think it is. The IMF has just said that we're going to grow faster this year than any other G7 advanced industrialised country. Our inflation is below the Eurozone average in the UK, though still high, but it's relatively low compared to our competitors. We've got a relatively low level of government debt compared to other advanced countries. And mortgage rates in the US are nearer 7 or 8% when they're just above 6% in the UK. So this is a global trend. This is a long-term move away from low interest rates. But you get the sense that the political atmosphere in the UK is so febrile and we're such a kind of high-profile currency and our media is so ubiquitous across the world. It's almost as if financial markets, currency speculators are targeting sterling because they know the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, they are on a sticky wicket, to use a cricketing analogy, with so many members of their own parliamentary party, frankly, out to get them. Liam, thank you very much uh, indeed. With not two lips from Amsterdam, but Bitcoin from Amsterdam for the moment. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll catch up with you later. Today, 115,000 postal workers walk out in a dispute over pay and terms and conditions. Yes, a huge strike. 21 strike days scheduled between now and December. Christmas, of course, so uh, no letters being delivered. Items posted the day before or after strike days uh, also delayed. For businesses who rely on Royal Mail to deliver their products, it's a challenging time. Dave Ward, General Secretary of the Communications Workers' Union, spoke to GB News earlier. This is what he said regarding the chairman's claims that Royal Mail was losing a million pounds a day. Well, I think if that's true, that since April, um, when they walked away from our agreement, uh, that the company's now losing a million pounds a day, uh, we want to see the actual facts of that. Uh, but if that's true, they should be sacked for gross mismanagement because what they've done is stalled the change programme in favour of this new asset stripping, levelling down business plan. And, you know, to, there's no other way of saying this. This will destroy Royal Mail as you know it today. Uh, it will also be about sort of stripping back on all the decent jobs that we fought for for years and years. And these are good people. Our members have voted, you know, 98% in favour of strike action on a massive turnout of 77%. The, the support is rock solid up and down the country. We're the ones that are actually defending the services and people like Simon Thompson and the board are out to destroy it and make more money and more profit for themselves and their shareholders. That's the view of the union, the CWU. Well, our reporter Ellie Costello went to meet the owner of a postal brownie company who's very concerned about the effects of the strike. We've been sending our brownies out since the start of the pandemic. We post them on a Thursday, make them fresh on a Wednesday, and they are sent next day delivery. Because we use fresh butter, eggs, fresh fruit in our brownies, they have a short shelf life. So, you know, if they do go missing or they don't get to their cust my customers on time, the shelf life will be reduced and the quality of the brownie will therefore be reduced. And I want to make sure that they are perfect. So it's essential that they get there next day. Jessica Baines is the owner of One Part Love Bakery, specialising in postal brownies. She's concerned about the latest Royal Mail strike, which starts again today, over pay and working conditions. The strike is significant. Royal Mail delivers to 31 million addresses six days a week. 115,000 members are on strike today from across Royal Mail and Parcel Force. 
The Communication Workers Union, the CWU, say it's the biggest national strike of any sector this year. 21 days will be affected by the strikes, which the union says will have a dramatic impact on peak periods such as Black Friday, Cyber Monday and the run up to Christmas. I thoroughly support um, my postie and I f thoroughly support the strikes, but the impact that it will have on my business is quite substantial. For me, not knowing when the product will get there is a huge thing for me to have to consider. I'll have to change my postal days, then my baking days, and the knock-on effect it has to my business throughout predominantly November, which is the time where people are purchasing things for Christmas. It's such a huge month income-wise for our business that we really, really rely on, and not to have that postal service available to us or for there to be issues with getting the brownies to the customers, it's going to make such an impact on my business financially and and it's something that's quite worrying. I came to the CWU headquarters to find out their reaction to the struggles of small businesses. Firstly, we thank Jess for her support and, and her solidarity. Um, clearly, we don't want to, uh, businesses to suffer. It's not greedy postal workers here. They've had a 2% pay rise imposed upon them. This is about postal workers cherishing the service and wanting to protect it and safeguard it for society and, and communities at large. Our members deserve to be respected. They delivered throughout the pandemic, they kept, they kept society connected, and they deserve better, quite frankly. There is a possibility that further action will be taken in December. We, we were considering that. Our objective is to reach an agreement. We don't want to take strike action, but we've been pushed into this position by the dogmatic and intransigent attitude of Simon Thompson, who's the CEO. Well, Royal Mail gave us this statement. Royal Mail is losing £1 million a day and must change faster in response to changing customer demands. The CWU leadership's choice of damaging strike action over resolution is weakening the financial position of the company and threatening the job security of our postmen and women. We call on the CWU leaders to cancel their planned strike action and accept our invitation to enter talks without further delay. We apologise to our customers for the inconvenience the continued strike action will cause and we are doing all we can to minimise any delays and keep people, businesses and the country connected. So how are small businesses feeling in the run-up to Christmas? Hopefully everything is resolved in time. Lots of other small businesses like myself are relying on this as well, that the strikes don't go ahead, everything's sorted out so that we can carry on business as usual and send our products around the UK. Ellie Costello, GB News. Those brownies looked fantastic. Yeah. Now let's bring you some uh, news from Thames Valley Police with this murder inquiry they launched uh, uh, following the uh, hunt for missing Leah Croucher. You remember she disappeared in 2019. Well, human remains were found by detectives yesterday. And a massive three and a half year search for Miss Croucher, who was 19 when she went missing. It's focusing on a house less than half a mile from where she was last seen. It's around the Milton Keynes area, where we can now cross and speak to GB news reporter Jack. Carson, who is outside the property. Jack, the police are uh, issuing a new appeal. Yes, they are. Like you said yesterday, Thames Valley Police announced that they discovered human, marine, human remains at a property here on Locksbear Drive in Milton Keynes, which was being investigated in connection with the disappearance of Leah Croucher. Police said her rucksack and other personal possessions had also been found at the property after a tip-off from a member of the police on Monday. She said she was 19 when she went missing in February 2019 here in Milton Keynes and it sparked a massive three and a half year search. During the course of that investigation, over 1,200 hours of CCTV footage was, was, was gone through and over 4,000 house-to-house inquiries were made, but it was only Monday that the police were alerted to a property here. Now, she vanished while walking to work at around 8.15 a.m. on Buzzacott Lane, which you said is only about half a mile away from this location. In a statement from the police yesterday, they said the forensic exam examination continues and will do for some time and it's likely to take some time to formally identify the deceased. Now this morning, I'm not sure whether you can see behind me, but people have been coming to, lay their, to pay their respects and lay flowers and candles here. Members of the neighbourhood, residents, people that knew the family. Uh, now Leah's family continue to be kept informed and updated and the head of crime for Thames Valley Police, Detec Detective Chief Superintendent Ian Hunter said that if anyone has any information which may be relevant to please get in touch with the Thames Valley Police, even recognise that even though it was three years ago, 
ago. If people have still got CCTV footage, anything that might help in this inquiry, they're very much open to receiving that. Yeah, and Jack, what's been the response of uh, the local neighbourhood there? Because we're now learning from Thames Valley Police themselves, they've actually acknowledged they didn't search this house back in the original 2019 search when she went missing. Well, people, I think, are shocked at how, how close to that location that she went missing. This place is, like you said, just half a mile, a short walk away. And it's a real sombre mood here this morning. Neighbours neighbor, neighbor, and families that you said would have come together at the time of, of, of her, her originally going missing, um, quite shocked. Just a few yards away from the police cordon here, there's still a, uh, a rusted uh, missing poster that was put up by the Thames Valley Police at the time. Some residents you know, saying um, across social media that they remember her going missing and all the flyers all over, all over um, the town here. And I think just a sense of shock that it's so close to where she went missing. Jack, thanks very much indeed for updating us there at the scene. Thank you. Lots more to come over the next two hours. We'll take you live to um, the charity event, uh, which is celebrating its 10-year anniversary today, where we'll see Prince, uh, Prince William and Princess Kate. And also we'll bring you the latest from Westminster on the Prime Minister's Wars. Let's get the weather done. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Most of us having a fine October day today, but there are one or two exceptions across the far south. A lot of cloud and some outbreaks of rain and turning wet and windy in the northwest too. That is because of this weather system and it's in the south. Uh, because of this weather system that we're keeping a lot of cloud, mist and murk. But most of the country between those two weather systems, dry and fine. Plenty of sunshine across southern and eastern Scotland, the eastern side of Northern Ireland, northern England, much of Wales and the Midlands. And even in the south, actually turning a bit drier across the southwest and the rain and drizzle easing across the south coast too. But stay fairly cloudy in the southeast. Some rain coming into western Scotland and northern Ireland and the breeze picking up in the northwest too. Temperatures generally in the mid-teens, feeling pretty pleasant in that October sunshine if you've got it. Now we will see a bit more of that rain spreading through the central belt during this evening and then down into southern Scotland. Another band of rain then follows on behind across northern Scotland and Northern Ireland, again staying fairly blustery. For the south, most of the night dry, but notice Cloud and rain thickening up once more in the southwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere again, a bit of a chilly one where skies do stay clear. We'll be down into single figures. Misty murky then for some in the morning with some fog around and the rain and drizzle will become more extensive across the south through the day. At the same time, rain is edging in from the north. So a bit of a mishmash tomorrow. Some slices of northern England, north Wales, may stay dry and bright through the day, but elsewhere expect some cloud and rain and temperatures a little bit lower, particularly across northern areas, particularly for Scotland, with the very frequent showers coming in here and fairly blustery conditions too. A band of wet weather will continue to sink southwards. The rain should ebb away on Friday evening across the Midlands and East Anglia too, leading to many places having a bright start to the weekend. There will be sunny spells on both Saturday and Sunday, but expect showers and a fairly brisk breeze as well. Bye for now. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone.
We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Good afternoon. It's exactly one minute past one. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. Some Tory backbenchers are urging the Prime Minister to abandon her tax-cutting plans unveiled last month. Last night, Liz Truss came under pressure from Conservative MPs at a meeting of the 1922 Committee. It comes just days after the Bank of England intervened for a second time with an emergency support package. Downing Street says Ms Truss's sole focus is delivering the economic growth plan. Conservative MP Lee Anderson was at the meeting last night. He told us the vast majority support the PM. Well, I was at that meeting. It was anything but hostile. I think the media trying to cause a bit of a stir again. Yes, colleagues raised uh, relevant questions, challenging questions to the Prime Minister. She answered them pretty well, I think. She said she's prepared to listen to all of us. She's going to have us in over the next few weeks to listen to us all before any big decisions are made. I think that's the right thing to do. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel, but critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record. The charity Asylum Aid, who are bringing the challenge, are arguing that tight timescales are leading to unfairness and impacting people's ability to access justice. A nurse accused of murdering babies allegedly wrote notes reading, I'm evil and I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. Prosecutor Nick Johnson KC told Manchester Crown Court the notes were found following a search of Lucy Letby's home. Letby is charged with murdering seven babies and attempting to murder ten others at Countess of Chester Hospital in 2015 and 2016. The 32-year-old denies all of the allegations. Around £4.5 billion awarded as part of the COVID-19 furlough scheme was lost through mistakes and fraudulent claims, a public spending watchdog has warned. The National Audit Office is criticising the government for not doing enough when it rolled out the scheme, which cost an overall £97 billion. However, it does say the scheme met its primary objective of protecting workers and businesses. A government spokesperson says they're still working to root out those who abused the system, with £1.1 billion expected to be recovered by HMRC over the next two years. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting to start treatment at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. Meanwhile, the number of people waiting more than a year has hit a total of more than 387,000. Royal Mail workers are striking today in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers' Union says 115,000 members are joining picket lines outside of Royal Mail offices. It's one of a series of 19 walkouts planned against various proposals by the company. Royal Mail says the union's action is weakening their financial position. However, the CWU's General Secretary says the Royal Mail's planned changes will not improve the service. It's not about modernisation. Uh, in fact, it's insulting the intelligence of all postal workers and I think the public and businesses to suggest it's anything other than uh, an asset stripping business plan and a levelling down agenda. And frankly, we're not going to support a three-and-a-half-year-long search for a teenager in Milton Keynes has turned into a murder investigation. 
Leah Croucher was 19 when she disappeared on her way to work in 2019. Detectives have now found some of her belongings at a house in the area where she was last seen. Yesterday, they found human remains. The Metropolitan Police will start using data to predict which men in London might be violent towards women and girls. The Met Commissioner says the force is working with a data network of men in the capital to forecast who could commit violent crimes against the opposite sex. Sir Mark Rowley told a police conference that he wants to use the information, based on previous behaviour, to stop offenders before they offend. Meanwhile, the force has announced that it's currently investigating more than 600 sexual and domestic abuse allegations against its own officers. You're watching GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Let's get back to Mark and Gloria. Ray, thanks very much indeed, and welcome back to GB Newsday with me, Mark Longhurst, and uh, Gloria De Piero. And coming up, could it be another day, another U-turn? Could the Prime Minister be set to reverse uh, uh, mini-budget proposals, in particular uh, that uh, question of corporation tax? Downing Street did hold a briefing with journalists this morning where they said there would be no U-turns, and also she declined to say... Uh, he declined to say whether Liz Truss was concerned about a loss of confidence in her leadership after a fairly bruising meeting with some Tory MPs. We'll bring you all the latest on this. Also coming up, the NHS declaring an amber alert for the first time. Blood supplies dropping to dramatically low levels. Hospitals have been told to implement plans to protect their stocks, meaning non-urgent operations requir requiring blood could be postponed, ensuring they're prioritised for patients who need them most. We'll be speaking to an NHS doctor about that. And the campaign group Asylum Aid bringing a new challenge to the government's plans to send asylum seekers on flights to Rwanda. We'll have the latest from the court. Home Secretary Suella Braverman is apparently wanted to expand the policy, but will the courts mean her plans stay grounded? We'll be getting the latest from the court on this. And keep your views on all these topics coming. GB Views at GBNews.uk. We want to hear from you on all of today's big stories and what you think of another U-turn maybe coming down the pipeline. Reports are growing this afternoon that Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng may be on the brink of a U-turn on more of that so-called mini-budget, in particular, corporation tax. Well, as we've been reporting, pressure growing within her party, even from the Bank of England, saying it won't intervene again to calm the markets in the wake of the turmoil of the past weeks, that its bond-buying programme will end tomorrow, it says. The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley, insisted this morning that ministers would stay the course on that budget, something the Prime Minister's spokesman doubled down on this morning. But... Liz Truss enduring that bruising meeting with MPs last night, the 1922 Committee of Backbenchers, and prominent Tory MP Robert Halfen accusing the Prime Minister of trashing workers' conservatism and everything that the party has stood for over the last decade. We're joined now by Kevin Schofield, political editor of the Huffington Post. Kevin, uh, the Prime Minister's spokesperson told political journalists uh, in the daily briefing this morning, no more U-turns, that budget and the plans in it, the remainder will remain. And now we hear reports that actually there will be another U-turn. Just clear it all up for us, Kevin, make sense of it for us. What's going to happen? Um, I wish I could clear it up. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think what, you, what you've got to bear in mind is that Liz Truss, uh, on the eve of the Conservative Party conference, gave an interview to the BBC in which she said that the 45p abolition, the abolition of the 45p income tax rate was definitely going ahead. And 24 hours later, she U-turned on it. So the Prime Minister spokesperson saying at lunchtime today that, um, uh, that there'll be no other U-turns, I think I would take that with a huge pinch of salt. I think it's Bloomberg who are now reporting that there will be a U-turn or there's certainly talks about a U-turn. So I would say that's probably pretty authoritative. Um, MPs that I'm speaking to are saying there is going to have to be some sort of U-turn. You mentioned uh, corporation tax, glory. I think, yeah, that's definitely the one that's most likely to be changed, um, which would be a humiliation, really, for 
Liz Truss, you know, she's talked about cutting taxes all the way through the total leadership um, campaign. In particular, she mentioned corporation tax not putting it up to 25 pence from 19 pence as Rishi Sunak wanted to do. So this is a totemic policy, really. Um, and if she was to U-turn on it, it would be really embarrassing, to put it mildly. And it'd be yet another pretty shattering blow to her uh, political credibility. Yeah, well, let's talk about consequences. If this does occur, and we are getting more and more sources suggesting that Number 10 has confirmed that U-turn is under discussion, um, what does it do, well, not just for her, but for Kwasi Kwarteng? I mean, is she likely to sacrifice him to save the government, effectively? Well, yeah, I mean, maybe if push comes to shove, she might have to do that. But what you've got to remember is it wasn't just Kwasi Kwarteng's mini-budget. It was Liz Trussie's mini-budget as well. He was implementing everything that she had um, declared that she wanted to do during the Conservative Party leadership contest. So it would be just as embarrassing for her. So I think throwing him over the side might buy her a little time, but I don't think it's going to satisfy Conservative MPs for very long. I spoke to quite a few of them last night who attended the 1922 committee meeting. Um, and I have to say, I saw what Lee Anderson said to you earlier. I think... Um, I think he, he must have been at a different meeting because from the ones I was speaking to last night, it sounded pretty grim um, from the Prime Minister's point of view. The vast majority, if not all the questions I was told were hostile towards her. Um, criticisms of the government were met with banging on the desks so of, uh, of approval, basically. Um, someone said to me that she was like cardboard, she was wooden very unimpressive and you know if the aim of her going to the 1922 committee was to win round her critics within the party then it certainly failed um so yeah i think there's a, a mood now building amongst conservative mps that even though it would appear bizarre to change leaders again so soon after they got rid of boris johnson it may well be the only option that um that they've got to try and salvage something from the current political crisis i mean that's sounds so unthinkable. They've, they've just got rid of one of their prime ministers who delivered them a massive majority. But you're saying, seriously, that that unthinkable option to get rid of another one just weeks after being elected by Conservative Party members, it's on the table, in your view? It's certainly been discussed. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that. I'm, I'm not saying that it would definitely happen. I think you're right. It would still seem bizarre. And I think ordinary members of the public would just think that the government or the Conservative Party had completely lost its marbles, really. But, um, but yeah, it is definitely under consideration. They're looking at the same opinion polls as, as we are. Labour are miles in front. Um, as I say, uh, Liz Truss was very unimpressive by all accounts at this um, 1922 committee meeting last night. She didn't reassure anyone. In fact, I think it probably hardened the views of a lot of um, MPs against her. So they're now thrashing around looking for an escape route. Now, nothing is straightforward because under Tory party rules, the members would need to have a say. Yeah. Um, so they might have to twist the rules in some way to keep the members out, which again would be hugely controversial. So it's not straightforward, but certainly no. it is under consideration. And, and, I, and I think the rules say there can't be another election for a year unless, as you say, they, they change the rules. But one assumes that will be Rishi Sunak coming back into uh, consideration. He's kept his counsel. No one's seen or heard from him. Is that the suggestion that the Sunak camp, all these MPs that voted for him rather than Liz Truss, would actually put him uh, in prime position? Yeah, perhaps. Although, I mean, it's such a fast-moving um, situation. I spoke to one Rishi Sunak supporter this time last week, who basically said he didn't think Rishi Sunak would, would fancy it, having been through a pretty bruising <laughs> leadership campaign. But all bets are off now. You know, I've seen yeah. someone else, Paul Goodman, the editor of Conservative Home, suggesting a sort of Penny Morden Rishi Sunak dual ticket, perhaps. As I say, there's all sorts of theories um, going around Westminster right now, but it's a, it's a pretty chaotic environment. Really interesting analysis, Kevin. Kevin Schofield, political editor of The Huffington Post UK. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, well, plenty of interesting analysis coming in from you as well. Uh, Mary, first of all, written to us to say, I think the 1922 committee is gunning to get Liz Truss out because they wanted Sunak. It's all so unfair. She was voted in by Conservative members and should be allowed to get on with the job. What has happened to democracy? Question mark. James says people need to cut Liz Truss some slack. She's probably getting it in the neck as Donald Trump has endorsed her economic policy. And look what he did with the US economy. Love him or hate him. She's obviously rattling the cabal, and is that a bad thing? I don't think we've heard from President Trump, or the former president, yet. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, an, an additional uh, element. Audrey, first of all, uh, if there are cuts to be made, start with PMs, MPs' expenses claims, rather. Close down the House of Lords. Fire all the has been sitting there. Most appear to be sleeping anyway in this archaic waste of space. Dot, 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 dot. Thank you for that. Keep them coming. Uh, GBviews at GBnews.uk. Well, let's cross over to Westminster now and get the latest live from our political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Tom, we cannot keep up. We spoke to you an hour ago. You said you'd been at the Prime Minister's uh, official spokesperson's briefing. Absolutely no U-turns. An hour later, we speak again. There's going to be a U-turn. It is heavily reported. Bring us up to date. Gloria, it's hard to emphasise how fast things have moved in the last 60 minutes. Now, um, at around midday, we were all being told by the Prime Minister's official spokesman that the policy has not changed. Note the has rather than the will not change. Could that have been uh, a clue? Could that have been something? Or are we reading far too much in to just words from a spokesperson? Has there genuinely been uh, a decision made or not within number 10? Because that is one of the unknowns here. It's widely reported now that in the Treasury, civil servants are working up plans to reverse elements of the mini-budget, and yet we're not sure as to whether or not the elected government of this country has agreed to that or not. Clearly, options are being explored, but have decisions been taken? That remains an unknown. However, one of the most heavily rumoured elements of this is looking at corporation tax, and this is the most peculiar element of the entire situation because corporation tax was due to rise 19p in the pound to 25p in the pound for British businesses. That tax rise was scrapped budget. Liz Truss just yesterday at Prime Minister's Questions was defending the decision to not raise that tax. The opposition was calling it a tax cut. She was saying no, we're simply not raising this tax on businesses in the face of a recession. It was one of her key points in the leadership election, her, her almost flagship policy of differentiation between herself and Rishi Sunak, one of the main reasons perhaps why she got elected by Conservative Party members by a sizeable margin back over the summer. And yet now, the widest rumours and the most heavily reported rumours are that that very flagship policy of Liz Truss's leadership election could well be the one to be ditched. Now, that's potentially £19 billion of extra revenue if the government hikes taxes on businesses. However, economists sympathetic to Liz Truss have been saying for quite some time, indeed Liz Truss herself has been saying for quite some time, that raising taxes on businesses in the face of a recession would be an economically mad thing to do that this is the way that you may well choke off any hope of a recovery, any yeah. hope of growth. And Liz Truss has predicated her entire premiership on getting yeah. that growth. Well, if she U-turns on this particular flagship policy, it's hard to see how that growth will materialise. Yeah, Tom, just uh, alert people, the Telegraph is the latest to go with this line. Downing Street working on mini-budget U-turn over corporation tax. Uh, that's almost as if it's come from Conservative Central Office, some would say, if it comes from the Telegraph. What are the consequences of this if it does take place? Does this mean the Chancellor's had it? If this takes place, it's hard to see how the Chancellor or indeed the Prime Minister has any authority whatsoever. I should say, I should really emphasise that there has been a leadership election, that the Conservative Party membership have overwhelmingly backed Liz Truss. And one of her flagship policies in that leadership election was that cancellation of the corporation tax rise. Now, if Liz Truss feels forced to U-turn 
on this. It's hard to see how Number 10 has any authority at all. This would be a Prime Minister in office, but not in power. This raises far more questions than it answers on the authority of this government, on this government's, frankly, this government's ability to govern. It's really quite that profound. OK, Tom, thank you very much indeed for the moment. Back to you, of course, as we learn more. And, Who knows uh, what will happen in the next I say, hour. Yeah, maybe less than 60 minutes, perhaps the next 30 minutes. We shall see. But thanks for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Now, it's been described as the biggest strike to take place in any sector so far this year. Today, 115,000 postal workers will walk out in a dispute over pay and terms and conditions. Well, 21 strike days scheduled between now and December. Christmas coming up, remember, and during those strike days, no letters being delivered, items posted the day before or even after strike days still being delayed. For businesses who rely on Royal Mail to deliver their products, it's a challenging time. Our reporter, Ali Costello, went to meet the owner of a postal brownie company, very concerned about the strike. We've been sending our brownies out since the start of the pandemic. We post them on a Thursday, make them fresh on a Wednesday, and they are sent next day delivery. Because we use fresh butter, eggs, fresh fruit in our brownies, they have a short shelf life. So, you know, if they do go missing or they don't get to their cust my customers on time, the shelf life will be reduced and the quality of the brownie will therefore be reduced. And I want to make sure that they are perfect. So it's essential that they get there next day. Jessica Baines is the owner of One Part Love Bakery specialising in postal brownies. She's concerned about the latest Royal Mail strike, which starts again today, over pay and working conditions. The strike is significant. Royal Mail delivers to 31 million addresses six days a week. 115,000 members are on strike today from across Royal Mail and Parcel Force. The Communication Workers Union, the CWU, say it's the biggest national strike of any sector this year. 21 days will be affected by the strikes, which the union says will have a dramatic impact on peak periods such as Black Friday, Cyber Monday and the run-up to Christmas. I thoroughly support um, my postie and I f thoroughly support the strikes, but the impact that it will have on my business is quite substantial. For me, not Knowing when the product will get there is a huge thing for me to have to consider. I'll have to change my postal days, then my baking days, and the knock-on effect it has to my business throughout predominantly November, which is the time where people are purchasing things for Christmas. It's such a huge month income-wise for our business that we really, really rely on, and not to have that postal service available to us or for there to be issues with getting the brownies to the customers, it's gonna make such an impact on my business financially and it's something that's quite worrying. I came to the CWU headquarters to find out their reaction to the struggles of small businesses. Firstly, we thank Jess for her support and, and her solidarity. Um, clearly, we don't want to, uh, businesses to suffer. It's not greedy postal workers here. They've had a 2% pay rise imposed upon. This is about postal workers cherishing the service and wanting to protect it and safeguard it for society and, and communities at large. Our members deserve to be respected. They delivered throughout the pandemic, they kept, they kept society connected and they deserve better quite frankly. There is a possibility that further action will be taken in December, we, we were considering that. Our objective is to reach an agreement, we don't want to take strike action, but we've been pushed into this position by the dogmatic and intransigent attitude of Simon Thompson, who's the CEO. Well, Royal Mail gave us this statement. Royal Mail is losing £1 million a day and must change faster in response to changing customer demands. The CWU leadership's choice of damaging strike action over resolution is weakening the financial position of the company and threatening the job security of our postmen and women. We call on the CWU leaders to cancel their planned strike action and accept our invitation to enter talks without further delay. We apologise to our customers for the inconvenience the continued strike action will cause and we are doing all we can to minimise any delays and keep people, businesses and the country connected. So how are small businesses feeling in the run up to Christmas? Hopefully everything is resolved in time. Lots of other small businesses like myself are relying on this as well, that the strikes don't go ahead, everything's sorted out so that we can carry on business as usual and send our products around the UK. Ellie Costello, GB News. 
Let's just bring you some breaking news on the currency markets reacting to this suggestion. We may be hearing about another U-turn on corporation tax. Uh, we can tell you the pound in this past um, sort of half an hour or so has, has risen 1.46% to nearly 130. It's 112.62 on the currency markets at the moment. To remind you, it was below 110 at one point earlier today. So uh, clearly some reaction there on the currency markets. Coming up, we'll be speaking with a doctor after the NHS has declared an amber alert for the first time as blood supplies dropped to dramatically lower levels before that. Time for a short break. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12pm. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Time is 1.27. Thanks for being with us here on Newsday. There's been a surge in the number of people trying to donate blood after the NHS declared an amber alert for the first time as blood supplies dropped to dramatically low levels. Yes, there was an amber alert. Hospitals being told to implement uh, plans to protect stocks. It could mean non-urgent operations requiring uh, blood being postponed. Our reporter, Alice Porter, visited Chess Medical Centre in Chesham and spoke to one man who has donated an incredible 99 times. I mean, 97 is an extraordinary achievement. You'll have your 100th donation next year. Firstly, just explain why you've wanted to become such a regular blood donor. I've been mean, doing it for almost 30 years now. So I started when I was 18. Um, my dad has always given blood, so I just sort of... It's not family tradition, but I've just carried on. Um, and um, increasingly, I've realised, you know, friends or family members have needed blood transfusions, and so I've just sort of kept on giving. And how easy is it to make a blood donation because we were just hearing there that some people particularly in the last 24 hours have, have struggled to make appointments just talk me through your process of regularly booking appointments i mean how many months a time are you making donations um i give about three or four times a year um and whenever i've given the next day i go online or go on the app there's a blood app um and book my next appointment three or four months hence i mean it, it will tell you when the next time is you can give and then you just choose a time which you want to turn up and do it um, and just make sure you keep the appointment um, when, uh, when the time comes. Uh, so it's a, you sort of need to get into the habit a bit like when you go to the dentist and they say to you at the end, oh, when do you want to book for your next appointment? You sort of need to be a bit on it like that. I think so, because if you wait the uh, allotted time and then try and book, you'll find that all the slots are gone, particularly if you're using a mobile unit that comes to your town. Um, I mean, there are sort of walk-in centres in in cities like London or something but um, for those even those you know they get booked up because the regular donors they book their appointment so 
um, you know, uh, there's always a slot for them when they come to give. Now, we're hearing that one of the reasons for this shortage in blood is because of the, the sort of knock-on from the pandemic, from when there were sort of staff shortages, and that's sort of continuing. Was that something you noticed during the pandemic, that it was harder to give blood? Um, it was slightly harder. Um, I had to look to see where the next place would be. Um, but and as I wanted to give anyway, I sort of you know, went out of my way slightly to go and give whenever I could. Um, because I suppose they weren't having as many people turning up because there were people worried about... Obviously, they couldn't have as many people in the sessions because of social distancing or all those sorts of other aspects. And I just want just final question to you is I know some people watching this may think this what you're doing is absolutely sort of marvellous, but say, look, I'm a bit squeamish. I'm not great with needles. I know you said to me earlier that actually you're a bit squeamish as well and can feel a bit faint. What would your sort of advice be? Yeah, I am. I mean, I mean, I don't want to watch other people do it, but I don't mind just lying back and not, you know, not thinking about it and just lying there for five minutes. I mean, you know, every donation can save up to three people's lives. So you think you were doing that three or four times a year. You know, that's an amazing thing to do. Absolutely. Look, Simon, thank you so much for, for meeting me. Hopefully we can meet you for when you have your 100th donation. Um, I have to say I have donated blood before, but it's been a long time, so you've inspired me to get back there and make an appointment. So thank you so much for your time. I mean, such an important issue whilst we're having these blood donation shortages. Alice Porter updating and said, well, there is a problem in that uh, they haven't got the staff to actually take the donations, we're being told. Just to update you, the NHS saying usually they have six days of supplies uh, available. Currently, that's fallen down below two days. That's why the Amber Alert has gone out. Let's now speak to Dr Jess Harvey, GP uh, in Shropshire. Uh, Dr Harvey, what are you being told by the NHS uh, on this particular problem? Hi, well, thanks for having me on. I mean, the gentleman that you've just had on there, I think, has probably done my job for me in a way, just <laughs> explaining the importance of it and, and how easy it is, in fact. You know, you're, you're totally right in that the NHS normally has around six days' worth of blood supplies, but now we haven't got that at the moment, which is why this Amber Alert has gone out. It's a combination of factors, really, uh, in terms of you've highlighted some, and in your interview there highlighted some of the others, so in terms of pay, people coming in to donate, so after COVID and during COVID, there's a bit of a, a reluctance to, to donate. Um, with social distancing, obviously the numbers that could be got through obviously went down slightly. And I think there's also a bit of a reluctance from people in general to kind of go out and be involved in those clinical situations and perhaps worried about the risk of them being put at risk of getting COVID. And then that in combination with staff shortages, uh, which may be sort of a combination of things, one of which is it, COVID is still here and people are still being affected by that. So if there is COVID going around and those staff members have got COVID, they obviously can't be there and working help with the donations, which means they have less capacity and that then has a cast, uh, casting on effect. So it's been a bit of a perfect storm, really. But actually, I think the fact that the app now is crashing and the website is crashing is, is a good sign in a way because it shows that actually it's times like this when I think as a country we really do rally. And it's remembering that blood donations can be really important. And I'm sure that everybody who's watching this right now will know of somebody who's been affected in some way and needed a blood transfusion. It's not always... Uh, you know, it can be thing from things as far as car crashes down to people who have blood conditions that need regular transfusions, Absolutely. down to operations, all those sorts of things. Of it's, it's much more commonly needed than yeah, people yeah. think. Jess, um, can I ask you about the yeah. figures out today about NHS waiting uh, lists? They are now at 7 million. We have never mm -hmm. had a figure of 7 million before on a waiting list. Just tell us about yeah. the sort of patients you see in your surgery what sort of operations are they needing and what is the impact of waiting for a very long time? What's their life like? Are they in pain, discomfort? Can their conditions get worse? What's the impact of a, of a waiting list like that? Yeah, I, I think this has been something that I guess we've perhaps seen coming. I think COVID probably accelerated, accelerated that to, to a certain degree. But I think what's important here is perhaps remembering that uh, phrase, and I'm, I'm not sure, you'll have to forgive me, I'm not sure who, who said it in the first place, but it was that uh, healthcare has a finite resource with infinite needs. And I think that's the situation that we now find ourselves in, in that the demand for surgery, for, for further secondary care 
is going up and up because our population is increasing because population needs are increasing because we're identifying those health conditions that need that need treating that need managing and that's a great thing but the problem is we need to have the resources there to also do it and that's where we're falling down because if there aren't the people there to do it then that waiting list for those that are there then starts to increase I guess from my perspective as a GP is I certainly am seeing the the knock-on effect from this. We certainly get contact from patients because their operations have been cancelled or because they need increasing pain relief because they're waiting for an operation. Um, they can contact us to try and get extra help despite the fact that we, they've been referred on. Um, but I think it's important to remember that actually whilst you may have problems that actually your general practitioners are still there to try and help and we will try and help with those problems but that's then having a cat having that problem for not it's not just the waiting list for secondary care that's then going up it means that the demands on general practice are also going yeah. up because those people are coming back to us and it's perhaps just sometimes yeah. people appreciating yeah. that we are under that demand at our end yeah, Dr. Jess Harvey, thanks very much indeed for joining us uh, from your surgery no there in Shropshire. Thank you very much indeed. Now, coming up live to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London because we're expecting the Prince and Princess of Wales. Why? We'll be telling you in a moment. First, news update with Ray. It's 1.35. I'm Ray Addison, keeping you up to date. Some Tory backbenchers are urging the Prime Minister to abandon her tax-cutting plans unveiled last month. Last night, Liz Truss came under pressure from Conservative MPs at a meeting of the 1922 committee. It comes just days after the Bank of England intervened for a second time with an emergency support package. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel. Critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record, though. Charity Asylum Aid, who've brought the challenge, say tight timescales lead to unfairness and impact people's ability to access justice. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. Royal Mail workers are striking in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers' Union says 115,000 members are joining picket lines outside of Royal Mail offices. It's the first of 19 walkouts planned for the coming months. Royal Mail says industrial action is weakening the financial position of the company. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're watching GB News. Don't go anywhere. Mark and Gloria will be back with Newsday in just a moment. OK, let's get a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.1277 and €1.1569. Price of gold currently standing at £1,486.80 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 6,850 points. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. 
You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back. You're watching GB Newsday, and it could be another day, another U-turn. Growing suggestions in Westminster that we may see uh, a reversal of the decision on corporation tax, part of that sort of uh, uh, mini-budget with the maxi-impact. Let's get the views now with our economics and business uh, editor, Liam Halligan, who is in Amsterdam. And, uh, Liam, as you were saying earlier, clearly uh, concern across Europe about the financial situation and the markets and so on, but in particular, here in the UK, UK, of course, it's been the reaction to that mini budget. We could be seeing a bit of rowing back this afternoon. We certainly could, Mark. I should explain. I'm here in Amsterdam uh, attending a conference uh, about the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. I'll be joining Nigel Farage this evening at 7 p.m. on GB News when we'll be discussing cryptocurrency and its importance to the global economy, its growing importance. But in the here and now, I'm watching the 10-year gilt market. That's the market where the government sell it, sells its own debt. And the yields on that debt, the cost of borrowing for the government that ripples out across the economy, affecting mortgages and personal loans and so on, the cost of that borrowing is gyrating around, almost at the mercy of political speculation now, that Downing Street is claimed to be, quotes, working on a partial U-turn to that mini-budget you mentioned. If Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, who's still in Washington, by the way, on his way back from those meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, if they do decide not to go ahead with that reversal of uh, the increase in corporation tax, if they decide to do what Rishi Sunak wanted to do, which was to increase corporation tax from 19 to, say, 25 percent. It really will knock the stuffing out of her kind of growth strategy, her supply side policies. And even if that calms financial markets, even if that convinces uh, international investors that the UK's fiscal plans, its tax and spending plans actually do stack up without that quite hefty uh, uh, tax increase, then that will seriously dent Liz Truss's authority even more than it's been dented in, you know, the month or so that she's been Prime Minister. A Prime Minister and Chancellor, when they take a hit on their economic credibility, which they undoubtedly have, how difficult or easy is it to get it back? Well, a reputation for financial competence and being a safe pair of hands with the nation's public finances is extremely hard won. The Conservative Party would claim, with some justification, that's central to their brand for being fiscally conservative, for not um, taking liberties with the public finances. And if you lose that reputation, then it can take you many years to get it back. I had a chat with Norman Lamont in the House of Commons earlier this week. He, of course, was presiding over the British economy when we fell out of the European exchange rate mechanism, Gloria, in the early 1990s. Ironically, when he was Chancellor, Norman Lamont was arguing against us joining the exchange rate mechanism, but he certainly took the blame for when we crashed out of the ERM. I think from 1992, it took the Conservatives you know, more than a decade uh, to be taken seriously again on the economy by the British public. We're no, by no means in a 1992 situation at the moment, but we are in a situation where a new Prime Minister, a new Chancellor have come in and they've announced 
a, a ridiculously named, it now seems, mini budget, and the market response has been extremely dramatic. And that's kind of ironic because the UK economy isn't actually in that bad a place. If you look at our debt levels, if you look at our growth uh, projections and so on, we're actually middle of the pack, even above average among the big G7 industrialised countries. I think what really has done for the Prime Minister and the Chancellor is the way those policies were presented, in particular the decision to uh, lower the top rate of income tax for the top earning 2% of the British workforce, those earning more than £150,000, combined with the scrapping of the cap on bankers' bonuses. I think that really stuck in the craw of a lot of Tory backbenchers. They felt they couldn't sell that to their electorates. And that's why a lot of those Tory backbenchers, you know, only a third of whom back Liz Truss in the leadership contest, of course, are increasingly talking openly now about, as amazing as it seems, submitting letters of no confidence and perhaps even sparking at some stage soon another Tory leadership contest. Unbelievable. As you say, Liam, thank you very much. Enjoy Amsterdam for now. Uh, well, as Liam was saying, the gilts uh, are strengthening, or the yields actually coming down, which means uh, that uh, the Bank of England's got a bit more wriggle room. But on the pound, we were telling you it was up about 1.5% earlier. It's fallen back a little bit in the last half hour. It's at 111, 112 to the dollar at the moment. But uh, it's on these uh, suggestions, of course, that ministers may be drawing up plans to reverse uh, some of these tax cuts, in particular corporation tax. And that comes despite a spokesperson for the Prime Minister this morning, uh, that the Prime Minister still rules out more U-turns on her mini budget. Bit of reaction from Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, who said that reports of a potential further U-turn uh, is a crisis, she said, made in Downing Street, and that working people are paying the price. Let's get the views now of a head of macro research at Accent Investment Managers, David Page. Um, David, it's a bit uh, difficult to keep up with a pace of change, both politically and indeed on the markets. As we say, the pound up and down gilts looking a little bit better, uh, but clearly it's, it's huge. Uh, dimension to all these political changes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we started to see an improvement come through after the Bank of England's operations yesterday, but these rumours overnight uh, and throughout the course of the morning that, that the government is working on a U-turn to these policies, which have fundamentally um, undermined a lot of faith in, in UK activity and, and UK markets. Um, is obviously seen as very encouraging. So, you know, it's only rumours at the moment. We need to get to the 31st of October. We need the Chancellor to present something that's credible for the medium term. Then we might be able to sort of move away from some of this, um, this, this terrible period that we've been through. Okay, I was talking with Liam Halligan just a moment ago about when you've taken a hit with the public on economic credibility, how difficult or otherwise is it to get back? What about the financial markets? When you take a hit with your credibility, with, with you lot, um, how easy is it to get your confidence back? And why does it yeah, matter, it actually, that your confidence is, 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 uh, is, is present? Well, I mean, so financial market confidence in the UK government basically lowers the borrowing costs. So it lowers the borrowing costs for the government, but it also lowers the borrowing costs for um, UK households. Um, and that's why normally you see um, governments proceed you know, with orthodox economic um, behaviour. Um, so, and it will be difficult to get that back. I mean, certainly for, for this government, but also for the institutions of the UK. Um, so firstly, we need to get a credible plan coming through first. We'll see what that what that looks like. Uh, secondly, then, we need to see if, if financial markets genuinely judge that the, the plan that's presented will lower debt in the medium term. And if that's the case, then they may well become more confident um, that we're seeing um, something that, that, that has um, a degree of faith to it and therefore will lower interest rates. Um, but there will be technical problems with this. I mean, the volatility that's been created and, and your, your previous correspondent likened this to sort of 1992. I think it's, you know, it is a similar order of magnitude in terms of the impact it's having on financial markets. The, the volatility that we've seen in financial markets leaves a lasting picture. You know, typically institutions trade in safe products. And when you see a lot of movements like this, it dissuades them from holding those products. Yeah. Again, 
raising the cost of borrowing. So that, that's really the importance of it. Right. And of course, looking at 1992, then 2008, the Bank of England stepped in, steadied the ship. Uh, there are suggestions that perhaps they're not quite so steady this time round. And, and a, a bit of a blame game going on, the Bank of England pointing the fingers at the FCA and at the, uh, the, the pension overseers and so on. Does that create in itself uncertainty in the markets? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, the Bank of England has done a very good job of stepping in and trying to sort of cope with a difficult situation. And it moved quite quickly um, to, to alleviate the situation nearly a fortnight ago now. Um, and obviously, we've seen a renewed pressure come about, um, as it said, that it, it has to wind down this operation, but has obviously put in place something else that it, it believes will provide liquidity to these, these um, markets. But yeah, the bank has... Um, thoroughly, uh, the bank and the FCA have thoroughly regulated uh, the banking sector since 2008. Um, but increasingly, the bank has been worried that the job hasn't been quite as thorough for the non-banking sector. And some of the issues that are coming up today are from that. So we've seen a couple of reports to suggest that the bank will be looking into that in more detail. Um, but fundamentally, you know, what this reflects is, is a government-led shock, which has then had ripple, impact, uh, ripple yeah. effects through the financial markets. David Page from Axel Investment Managers, thanks very much indeed uh, for bringing us your expert opinion. Thank you. Very clearly as well. Now, the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda is being challenged in the High Court today by the campaign group Asylum Aid. Well, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is saying she is committed to that policy uh, uh, to process the asylum seekers to Rwanda, but coming under fire, remember, at the party conference when she said it was her dream to send asylum seekers there. There are no reports of a row, indeed, between the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary over this immigration policy. The Prime Minister wanting to relax the visa rules as part of a push for growth. We can cross now to Catherine Forster, who's following events at the High Court and can bring us up to date. Catherine, please do so. Hello, yes, so I'm here at the High Court in central London today. I've been in this morning, uh, the case has been adjourned for lunch, we'll start back again at two o'clock. And it's another legal challenge which has been brought uh, against the government, this time by the charity Asylum Aid, um, regarding the government's controversial plan to send people that have crossed the channel illegally in small boats on a one-way ticket to Rwanda where they may be granted asylum 4,000 miles away in Africa. Now, so far, this is a two-day hearing expected to finish middle of tomorrow afternoon. We've been hearing the evidence from the charity represented by Charlotte Kilroy, QC. She has said that um, the government's position is inherently unlawful and unfair and on three grounds. The first thing they argue is that Rwanda is not a safe country for these people to be sent to. Then they've obvious, they also have issues about the speed, that people do not have the time to get the necessary advice and that also people are not being given enough information. Specifically, there is seven days before a decision is made that people will be allowed to get their evidence and get it listened to. Now, they are saying that that is not enough, but for the Home Office, Edward Brown KC is saying that seven days should be sufficient. And indeed, the judges have been saying does it need seven days to say how you got across Europe and why you didn't claim asylum in, in France? Foster, for now, thank you. And your unglamorous assistant behind you as well. Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's uh, move on to uh, other news now because uh, we've got the murder inquiry being launched by Thames Valley Police uh, following their search for the missing teenager, Leah Croucher. She disappeared in 2019 and human remains have now been found by detectives. A massive three and a half year search for Miss Croucher, who was 19 when she went missing, is focusing on a house less than half a mile from where she was last seen around Milton Keynes. And we're crossing live now to Milton Keynes to speak to GB News reporter Jack Carson, who is outside that property. Uh, the police are appealing for information, even though three years have passed. Yes, so G uh, Detective Chief Superintendent uh, Ian Hunter, who is the head of crime for Thames Valley Police, is, is appealing for anybody with any information. He says if you've got CCTV, for, even though it's three years ago, any kind of CCTV or any information that you might not think is relevant to this case, 
come forward and, and, and contact the Thames Valley Police in any way that you can. As you mentioned, of course, Miss Croucher vanished while walking to work at 8.15 a.m., just uh, about half a mile away here from the location where human remains, human remains were found, as well as her rucksack and other personal possessions as well. When that investigation, that missing person investigation was launched three and a half years ago, police searched over 1,200 hours of CCTV footage, uh, went door to door to 4,000 houses, conducted inquiries, but it was only Monday that a member of the public alerted them to the property, which is now being searched behind me. Um, at the time of her disappearance, she was described as very quiet and that she, even though she competed internationally in Taekwondo, her father said that she was not a fighter. Now, this morning and, the, and this afternoon, neighbours and residents have been visiting the property, might be able to see some of the floral tributes behind me to pay their respects and light candles as well. Um, I've been reading some of those, some of those respects and memorials. Um, one of them reading that, Leah, you were never forgotten and we never gave up. Another one reading, time for your parents to take you home. Now, it's worth noting that the statement from the police yesterday confirmed that the forensic examination does continue and it's likely to take some time to formally identify the deceased. But Leah's family continue to be kept informed and updated. Five to two. Thanks for being with me and Mark Longhurst. Uh, we still have another hour with you. We'll be discussing the latest on the pressure facing the Prime Minister, the state of the economy. And I've pre-recorded an interview with Red Len, arguably the most uh, influential trade union general secretary of our generation. He doesn't mince his words on what he thinks about various politicians. Before that, it's your weather. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Most of us having a fine October day today, but there are one or two exceptions across the far south. A lot of cloud and some outbreaks of rain and turning wet and windy in the northwest too. That is because of this weather system and it's in the south. Uh, because of this weather system that we're keeping a lot of cloud, mist and murk. But most of the country between those two weather systems, dry and fine. Plenty of sunshine across southern and eastern Scotland, the eastern side of Northern Ireland, northern England, much of Wales and the Midlands. And even in the south, actually turning a bit drier across the southwest and the rain and drizzle easing across the south coast too. But staying fairly cloudy in the southeast, some rain coming into western Scotland and Northern Ireland and the breeze picking up in the northwest too. Temperatures generally in the mid-teens, feeling pretty pleasant in that October sunshine if you've got it. Now we will see a bit more of that rain spreading through the central belt during this evening and then down into southern Scotland. Another band of rain then follows on behind across northern Scotland and Northern Ireland, again staying fairly blustery. For the south, most of the night dry, but notice Cloud and rain thickening up once more in the southwest. Quite mild here, but elsewhere again a bit of a chilly one. Where skies do stay clear, we'll be down into single figures. Misty murky then for some in the morning with some fog around. And the rain and drizzle will become more extensive across the south through the day. At the same time, rain is edging in from the north. So a bit of a mishmash tomorrow. Some slices of northern England, north Wales, may stay dry and bright through the day, but elsewhere expect some cloud and rain and temperatures a little bit lower, particularly across northern areas, particularly for Scotland, with the very frequent showers coming in here and fairly blustery conditions too. A band of wet weather will continue to sink southwards. The rain should ebb away on Friday evening across the Midlands and East Anglia too, leading to many places having a bright start to the weekend. There will be sunny spells on both Saturday and Sunday, but expect showers and a fairly brisk breeze as well. Bye for now. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. 
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The Shadow Chancellor is calling on the Prime Minister to reverse the government's tax-cutting plans amid speculation over a possible mini-budget U-turn. Rachel Reeves' comments come after Tory members of the 1922 committee urged Liz Truss to reconsider the Chancellor's fiscal measures. Downing Street says Miss Truss's sole focus is delivering the economic growth plan. The Bank of England has intervened twice with an emergency support package. However, that support comes to an end tomorrow. Conservative MP Lee Anderson was at the meeting of the 1922 committee last night. He told us the vast majority support the Prime Minister. Well, I was at that meeting. It was anything but hostile. I think the media trying to cause a bit of a stir again. Yes, colleagues raised uh, relevant questions, challenging questions to the Prime Minister. She answered them pretty well. I think she said she's prepared to listen to all of us. She's going to have us in over the next few weeks to listen to us all before any big decisions are made. I think that's the right thing to do. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel. However, critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record. The charity, Asylum Aid, who are bringing that challenge, argue that tight timescales are leading to unfairness and impacting people's ability to access justice. A nurse accused of murdering babies allegedly wrote notes reading, I'm evil and I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. Prosecutor Nick Johnson KC told Manchester Crown Court the notes were found following a search of Lucy Letby's home. Ms Letby is charged with murdering seven babies and attempting to murder ten others at Countess of Chester Hospital in 2015 and 2016. The 32-year-old denies all of the allegations. <coughs> Around £4.5 billion awarded as part of the COVID-19 furlough scheme was lost through mistakes and fraudulent claims, a public spending watchdog has warned. The National Audit Office is criticising the government for not doing enough when it rolled out the scheme, which cost overall £97 billion. However, it does say the scheme met its primary objective of protecting workers and businesses. A government spokesperson says they're still working to root out those who abused the system, with £1.1 billion expected to be recovered by HMRC over the next two years. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. Meanwhile, the number of people waiting more than a year has now reached 387,000. Royal Mail workers are striking today in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers Union says 115,000 members have joined picket lines outside Royal Mail offices. It's one of a series of 19 walkouts planned over various proposals by the company. Royal Mail says the union's action is actually weakening their financial position. However, CWU General Secretary Dave Ward says Royal Mail is proposing changes which will not improve the service. It's not about modernisation. Uh, in fact, it's insulting the intelligence 
of all postal workers and I think the public and businesses to suggest it's anything other than uh, an asset stripping business plan and a levelling down agenda. And frankly, we're not going to support that. A three and a half year long search for a teenager in Milton Keynes has turned into a murder investigation. Leah Croucher was 19 when she disappeared on her way to work in 2019. Detectives have now found some of her belongings at a house in the area where she was last seen. Yesterday, they found human remains. The Metropolitan Police will start using data to predict which men in London might be violent towards women and girls. The Met Commissioner says the force is using behavioural data to forecast who could commit, commit violent crimes against the opposite sex. Sir Mark Rowley told a police conference he hopes to stop offenders before they re-offend. Meanwhile, the force has announced that it's currently investigating more than 600 sexual and domestic abuse allegations against its own officers. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Mark and Gloria. Ray, thanks very much indeed, and welcome back to GB News Day. With uh, fevered speculation, I think we can say, growing at Westminster, that the government may be on the brink of a major U-turn, this time the central pillar of its mini-budget, the reversal of that corporation tax cut. Pressure has been growing on Liz Truss from within her own party and from the Bank of England, which has said it won't in intervene again to calm markets in the work of the turmoil of the past weeks. Well, earlier today, Foreign Secretary James Cleverly uh, went uh, on the broadcast media to insist that ministers will stay the course, something that the Prime Minister's spokesman has doubled down on this morning at uh, the lobby briefing. But that all now seems to have changed and it comes off the back of a bruising meeting with some of her MPs last night with the prominent Conservative Robert Halfon accusing the Prime Minister of trashing workers' conservatism and everything the party has stood for over the last decade. Well, Labour not surprisingly quick to react. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves saying this. Today's mess shows the utter chaos this government is in. This is a crisis made in Downing Street and working people are paying the price. Labour has said repeatedly that they need to reverse the kamikaze budget and restore confidence. This is now urgent as the Bank of England's intervention in the markets ends tomorrow. The Tories, she said, cannot allow the chaos caused by their mini-budget to continue any longer. Let's cross over to Westminster now and get the latest from our political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Tom, I just want to ask if it is time to think the unthinkable about Liz, Liz Truss's future. I say this because uh, it's just been uh, reported, uh, the polling expert, the polling expert of polling experts, John Curtis, saying Liz Truss is as unpopular as Tory former Prime Minister John Major was after Black Wednesday. We know how that scenario ended. Our Conservative MP is just going to sit back and let that happen to them, where they will all possibly lose their seats. Are they going to act? We do know how that ended, but of course we also do know that two years after Black Wednesday there was a leadership challenge against uh, John Major, the one performed by John Redwood, which, which uh, John Major actually won the put-up-or-shut-up election, as it was called in the mid-1990s. John Major remained Prime Minister and then, of course, led the party to a historic defeat, down below 200 seats in 1997 for the Conservative Party, something that they took 13 long years to build back up again from. Even in 2010, when the Conservative Party gained more seats than it had ever gained at any election in its history, it wasn't enough to bring it back into majority government. For that, they had to wait another five years. So, yes, 1997 was a really profound moment, and numbers that echo the 1990s will be chilling for Conservative MPs. There are a couple of uh, party constitutional issues uh, when it comes to removing a Prime Minister. First isn't a written rule, but it is the sort of moral authority that the membership have just installed this Prime Minister by a considerable margin, a double-digit lead over Rishi Sunak. Liz Truss was elected by, the, uh, by a sizeable majority of Conservative Party members to deliver a particular economic 
programme. And indeed, uh, Liz Truss has been in office as Prime Minister for a little over 30 days now. It would be really quite something for Conservative MPs to move against her, although that is what the mood sounds like it is. Indeed, one member of Parliament coming out of that 1922 committee meeting uh, last night was, was saying that if there was the ability to put in letters to Sir Graham Brady, Liz Truss would have met that threshold. Of course, uh, there is currently a rule within the operation of the uh, 1922 executive, the way in which a Prime Minister is removed, that famous letter writing and getting to uh, just over 10% 10, 10 of the party, um, uh, or, or a little bit higher, I think. Uh, the, the point here, yes, it's 54, um, 54 letters, I think. Uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. The point here is that you cannot do that again within 12 months. There's a period in which uh, there's almost immunity for a Prime Minister. Now, the executive yeah. of the 22 could change the rules, they have done before, but uh, that's a pretty seismic step. Yeah, T Tom, let, let's just uh, bring um, into this uh, mix. We've talked about the major government meltdown of 1992. Uh, uh, Lord Lamont, the um, 97 uh, onwards then, of course, uh, Labour came into power. Now, Lord Lamont, who uh, oversaw that um, meltdown with the ERM, he's just uh, been saying that the choices facing Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng are appalling. He would support a reversal of the mini-budget. He went on to say, sometimes the politics is the art of the possible. I think it's the art of choosing between the incredible and the utterly impossible. Possible. Now, where are we? Because Kwasi Kwarteng was in Washington. We understand he's on the way back. Are we likely to hear from the Chancellor or the Prime Minister a little later? Well, we were expecting some words from the Chancellor at quarter past this hour. That was announced uh, by the Prime Minister's official spokesman this morning. Whether or not that is still the plan uh, is still a little bit up in the air, but we may well be getting some words from the Chancellor uh, on, of course, his visit to the IMF and the World Bank and the meetings he's been having in Washington, D.C. We may well be getting some words on that in the next few minutes. Uh, however, whether or not the Chancellor will in that uh, time have been asked about the swirling rumours now, when those words will have been recorded, is, a, is an open question and one that uh, journalists here are scrabbling to find the answer to. So really what we're looking at here is a very difficult situation. The, char the, the Prime Minister would find it very difficult to announce, I would suspect, any big fiscal change, especially a change to that flagship policy of hers, without her Chancellor by her side. If number 10 were to freewheel, on economic policy, they might as well have uh, fired the Chancellor. Yeah, it would be yeah. overwhelmingly unlikely that they wouldn't make that unless the Chancellor was uh, back in the United Kingdom, and that may well be for some time. Of course, okay. it's uh, not unprecedented that uh, uh, we've been following planes before, and I think it was back in 2018 when Priti Patel was flying Tom. back uh, uh, from Israel that we were all following that plane for a Tom. meeting with the Prime Minister, and eventually she was sacked. Could we be in a similar position? Tom, Possibly. I just want to briefly ask you to look into your crystal ball. Do you think Listras and Kwasi Kwarteng will be in post come the next election? I know there are no certainties this. I want, I'm asking you what your hunch about the situation that we're in is. There are no certainties in this. There are several tricky positions for the Conservative Party right now. Do they look, frankly, uh, like they've made some terrible mistakes over the last uh, few months and remove yet another Prime Minister, rattling through what will be our fifth Prime Minister in a matter <coughs> of years? Or will they stay the course and hope that this growth plan has time to work. Well, I have to say, on the balance of probability and the feeling in Westminster today, it may well be that the Conservative Party is leaning towards looking silly enough to replace yet another Prime Minister, rather than looking sillier with the markets, perhaps, yeah, in that yeah. Uh, yeah. crude Probably. dichotomy, and, and may well be thinking about changing this Prime Minister. That being said, I mean, the, the last three weeks have been an extraordinarily long time in politics. The, the last three hours have, Tom, as well. Tom, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm just going to update people with what Lord Lamont has been saying, former Chancellor, of course, uh, saying the government has three choices. Reverse the changes in the mini-budget, 
uh, public expenditure cuts, which the Prime Minister has ruled out, said Lord Lamont, or try to fudge the arrangement with the OBR. On the third option, he said, I would advise against it. I think it would not impress the markets, but it will be a great temptation to the government to delay the decisions. If they do reverse the budget, I would support them, but I personally think that's rather unlikely, he said. So, now. we'll await this next, uh, well, another half hour and see how the situation changes then. Now, a court has heard a nurse accused of murdering babies on a neonatal ward wrote notes reading, I am evil and I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. Well, Lucy Letby is charged with murdering seven babies and then also attempting to murder ten others at the Countess of Chester Hospital back in 2015 and 2016. She denies all charges against her. Our North West of England reporter Sophie Reaper has been following the trial at Manchester Crown Court. The defence has now begun their opening in the Lucy Letby trial here at Manchester Crown Court. The former nurse has been charged with the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of a further ten babies while she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. She denies all of the charges against her. Now, in the prosecution's conclusion this morning, the jury heard that upon searching her home, the police had found a piece of paper which said things like, I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I am a horrible, evil person and the world is better off without me. Now, the jury was shown an image of this note, which said, also said things like, I'll never have children or marry. I'll never know what it's like to have a family. The words not good enough were underlined at the top and the word hate was in capital letters and circled several times. And then at the bottom of the note, there were six words together. I am evil, I did it. Now, once the prosecution had concluded, the defence began their opening here at Manchester Crown Court. Ben Myers KC told the jury they must be calm and they cannot let emotion overtake reason in this case. He also said Lucy Letby did her best to take care of the babies she was put in charge of. He said in no way did she want to harm them and he also described her as a dedicated nurse who loved her job. He then turned to discuss the notes that the prosecution had put forward and pointed out a part of the note where Ms Letby had written, I didn't do anything wrong. He also put to the jury that sometimes people just scribble things down when they are upset. Throughout the entirety, though, the defence maintained that Lucy Letby is not guilty. Sophie Reaper updating us there at Manchester and of course we'll uh, keep uh, on top of that case and report uh, for you what's happening at Manchester Crown Court. But let's now reflect on yet more problems it seems for the government. Reports now that the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, is being cut out of immigration reform plans. The Prime Minister Liz Truss preparing to relax visa rules as part of her push for growth. Well, Tory MPs worried about staffing shortages being faced by local businesses being told to bypass the Home Office and instead go to the Cabinet Office office and business department instead, which is, of course, a snub to Sweller Bravman and the Home Office. So broadband engineers, butchers, care workers, all in line for the visas, it seems, as the Treasury tells number 10, it's the quickest way to get growth. Let's speak now to an immigration lawyer, Hajup Singh uh, Bangal, and uh, it's uh, yet more confusion, it seems, from the heart of government. What, what do you make of these suggestions that uh, they're going to drop a lot of things just to get people in to get the economy growing? totally baffled by it just as everyone else at home is probably is goes against what we've been hearing for the last 10 years remember Theresa may was in government and or and even as home secretary she was saying we need to bring down net migration i.e the people coming here to live here now we don't know whether these visas are going to be granted are going to be temporary visas but ultimately they might lead to settlement if you're here under five years under a work permit, you can stay here permanently. It then brings into the question, well, if we needed butchers and care workers, then why did we stop people from the EU coming and taking them jobs, which they were doing anyway? How did this shortage come about? Was the shortage always there? If the shortage was always there, why were we not told about it um, before Brexit, before the vote, and people could have decided then? This is a shambles. Your home office, the government, are saying we want to send people to Rwanda at a cost of 80,000, 90,000 pounds per person with a capacity of 200 people. And on the other hand, we're saying, actually, we need people to do the jobs. 
um, we've already got one and a half million people living in the UK illegally. One and a half million estimated people who can't work, who are not allowed to work, who are part of a black economy working cash in hand. Now, if instead of calling more people in, wouldn't it be wiser for us to say, well, OK, let's train these people up and give them a chance to earn the right to live here? Right. One and a half million people can be trained. Why do we have to add to our population more when we already have an existing workforce that perhaps needs training? Yes. It also begs the question, why aren't these jobs being filled by British people? That's what we were told. We were told people would be made to come off the benefits and would be told to come and fill these jobs. That isn't happening. Why yeah. isn't it happening? What is a contingency? Yeah, it's, it's, it's also a bit of an odd mix, broadband engineers, butchers, care workers, although we know obviously about the, the problems in the care system. And we do remember talk about the, the Australian system being adopted where there were, there were points awarded as to uh, how useful you're going to be to the economy. Yeah, we already have a point system in place. Um, a lot of people don't know that, and it doesn't actually work. It's not been told, you know, it, it works great. We've had a point system since 2012 for the past 10 years, and in, under various forms, whether it's a highly skilled migrant, migrant program, whether it's a student visa program, whether it's a graduate scheme, whether it's the business visas, innovator visas. However, the, thing, the key and the crux of the matter is the Home Office is not fit for purpose. It cannot police this. It cannot administer this. Every year we get a report from the Home Affairs Select Committee telling us that this machinery is not fit to execute what we need, yet we keep on with it. We need a new Home Office, essentially. We need to knock the wall down and build it up again, not just paper over the cracks. Yeah. That is the problem here. And that's why there are different trains of thought. Um, right. You're right, from broadband engineers to butchers. You know, it's a, it's a wide range. But businesses are feeling the pinch. Businesses were promised that yeah. these jobs, there wouldn't be shortages. These jobs would be filled. British people would be trained. We've seen that with the drivers, the lorry driver vacancies as well. Yeah. The British people just aren't, um, you know, getting their HGV licenses and are not filling these vacancies. So okay. there was no contingency for that. Harjip Singh uh, Bangal, thank you very much indeed for bringing us uh, your reaction to, uh, again, more political turmoil, it seems. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Now, let's uh, take a quick look at uh, what the markets have been doing in reaction to all this political um, uncertainty in Westminster. The pound had rallied against the dollar uh, earlier today after speculation that we could be seeing another U-turn on the tax plans, although we are getting suggestions it's fallen back to about 111. Uh, we'll be uh, getting the views of economist Victoria Scholar uh, coming up. But first, a look at the weather. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Many places having a fine day today. There will be sunny spells over the next few days, but there's also going to be bands of showers whizzing through on a fairly brisk breeze, particularly across northern areas. A couple of weather fronts moving in tonight. These ones close to the south as well, but uh, say most places have been between these weather systems today. So it's a fine evening for many. But the cloud and rain is pushing in across the central belt of Scotland and then another line of rain coming into the Highlands and across Northern Ireland through the night. A few showers likely across Wales and southwest England, but much of England and Wales is having a dry night. Not as chilly as last night. It will easily drop down into single figures in some towns and cities, but uh, many places say staying well above freezing. Certainly, as I said, a lot milder than last night. As we go into Friday, it's a bit of a mess, really. Lots of cloud in the south with outbreaks of rain working their way from west to east. At the same time, a line of rain spreading from southern Scotland into northern England. Behind that, plenty of heavy showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But some brighter spells, much of northeast England, north Wales, having a dry and a fine day again. Temperatures in the south, close to average. A fresher feel, though, across Scotland and Northern Ireland with a a brisk wind. Much of that rain tends to shimmy out of the way during Friday night and into Saturday. So quite a few of us, certainly in the east, will start the weekend dry. But here comes another line of rain, quite heavy rain as, as well. But it does move through pretty rapidly during Saturday morning. But a wet spell for northern England and Scotland, some blustery winds again across the northwest. And then we're left with sunshine and showers for many during Saturday afternoon. Again, those showers tending to zip through on a Fairly brisk wind and temperatures close to average uh, across the south, a bit fresh further north. So low pressure dominating, bands of showers zipping through during the weekend with some brighter spells in between. This low could bring some more persistent rain on Sunday.
Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. It's 1.26. The Prince and Princess of Wales have arrived at the Copper Box Arena in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London. Yes, William and Kate at the event to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Core Coach, the programme being launched back uh, after the Olympics in 2012, remember, all in uh, response to the legacy ideals of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And we can now cross live to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and speak with our news reporter, Rosie Wright. The Royals are there, Rosie. They are indeed, Gloria. They arrived in the last hour to great fanfare, met some of the key members from the charity, including the CEO that I spoke to earlier. And there's real excitement for the individuals here. The Royals, it was the Royal Foundation who helped found the charity 10 years ago all part really of a drive after the Olympics to capitalise on that real excitement, but also make sure that funding meant it was going to be invested in young people, in their futures, and of course, their mental and physical well-being. That's something that we know the Prince and the Princess of Wales care deeply about. They've had a really active week this week in terms of championing young people's mental health with World Mental Health Awareness Day earlier this week. Now, in the Copper Box Arena behind me, we've seen events there before 10 years ago of things like um, hand Ball. You remember we all got really into that and also a wheelchair basketball. Uh, but right now they'll be having the option if they want to to take part in some football and some other type of activities to get a flavour of what the charity do. But crucially, I spoke to some of the people who've been trained up by the charity. Their whole mission is to take people from more working class, sort of uh, people who've had a bit of hardship and given them an opportunity to say, we'll give you an easier career path, we'll train you up in an apprenticeship so that you can teach other people how to play sport. And Renee is one of the people who's been through the apprenticeships, started it just when she was a teenager. For her, it's been utterly fantastic. It's changed the course of her adult life now as a young adult. And she told me why events like this today are really important. It's created an opportunity for us to push open doors that we didn't know were there to be opened. A lot of young people who uh, have the capacity to make the difference in the community don't feel like they're resourced often, uh, they feel like they're underrepresented. However, events like this just go to prove how much acknowledgement there is for young people with those kind of hopes and dreams. So yeah, it opens those doors and again, I'm one of the people who benefited from that. So the Aston Villa Foundation are obviously here to do football. We've got another organisation here doing some boxing where some apprentices have done their placement there. And we've got some young people who've been working with people living with disabilities uh, in activities like boccia, bowls and some small-sided games as well. 
So Renee is one of the over 700 people who've been through the apprenticeship programme to then be have equipped with the skills to be a coach themselves. Now, Renee said that she and the rest of the people at the organisation are really grateful that the Royals have lent their support and also providing publicity to the charity now marking 10 years. So I think there's some football going on behind me. Uh, I know that Prince William will be making a speech and an address and meeting uh, with people exactly like Renee who've been through the programme. So lots of excitement here in the Queen Elizabeth Park as the event gets underway. Thanks so much, Rosie. Uplifting stuff. Thank you. Um, I just want to bring you some breaking news. This is not about the government. No turmoil in the Conservative Party in this story. It's senior Labour MP Christina Rees, she is the Neath MP. She was Shadow Welsh Secretary under Jeremy Corbyn. She has had uh, the whip, the Labour whip, um, removed from her following complaints by staff working for her in her South Wales constituency. She will still be an MP, but she will sit as an independent while the investigation takes place. So, uh, as we've just been discussing at Westminster, Liz Truss under increasing pressure to change course uh, and over the past hour or so, uh, suggestions uh, that that may take place on corporation tax. The pound has, uh, well, not surged, it's actually increased a bit, gone, fallen back, but certainly the gilts uh, have come down, the yields have come down, which is good news, uh, on the suggestion that we may get a U-turn uh, on the mini-budget. Uh, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Rees reacting to that news as well, uh, saying that uh, she thought it was a positive move. Let's get the views of economist Victoria Scholar uh, joining us. Victoria, the market's trying to work out what's going on. It seems even many in Westminster are trying to work out what's going on. Yeah, of course, it's been a real roller coaster for the markets, particularly the UK government borrowing market over the last fortnight since the mini budget. But there does seem to be a bit of a reprieve with yields moving lower, which move inversely to price. So we've been seeing the bond market prices push a bit higher. Sterling is also staging some modest gains today. It appears to be that that was mainly after the Bank of England upped its intervention into uh, the government borrowing market, uh, trying to increase that support ahead of that deadline on Friday, tomorrow. That is the final day in which the Bank of England will complete its intervention. But there are suggestions that it could potentially go beyond that point. But as for now, Governor Andrew Bailey sticking to the fact that the programme is very much set to end on the 14th of October. Victoria, what do you make of the strong and heavy rumours that another plank of the so-called mini-budget outlined by Kwasi Kwarteng is to be reconsidered? I'm talking about Rishi Sunak's plan to increase corporation tax quite significantly, something Liz Truss said she would reverse if she won the leadership. Uh, that was in the mini-budget, that reversal, but it looks to be back on the table now. What's your thoughts about that and how it will go down? Well, the reason why the market reaction has been so bad to the mini budget is because there have been concerns that the government's plans, its um, pledges to cut taxes, rely too heavily on borrowing. Now, uh, if the Chancellor wants to alleviate a lot of that dysfunction from the market, he needs to prove that there's not going to be excess borrowing, that there is going to be a degree of fiscal discipline, and that requires at least spending cuts or less tax cuts. So clearly he's looking for ways to try and balance the budgets and uh, make the public purse um, in better shape ahead of that deadline that we know he's brought forward now to the 31st of October, which is interesting timing because now that announcement is going to actually come ahead of the Bank of England's rate decision, which is on the 3rd of November, I believe, before it was going to be afterwards. Now it's before. So if he can convince uh, the markets and investors that his plan is solid and he's not going to be heavily reliant on borrowing, then the Bank of England may not need to raise rates as much uh, at its meeting. And what do you make of this, um, well, growing tension, it seems, between the Treasury and the Bank of England and then the Bank of yeah. England and the FCA and, and the pension regulators? It seems there's a lot of sort of finger pointing going on between all these departments. 
Well, this is the really interesting thing and essentially why the market reaction has been so bad is because the Bank of England and the government, although they are independent entities from each other, typically work hand in hand in tandem with similar goals. The Bank of England very much focused on inflation and also keeping financial stability, calming financial markets, whereas the government um, has been focusing on growth, its plans to cut taxes are very much stimulus measures, and those tend to have inflationary side effects. So there's this tug of war going on between the two institutions, whereas they should be working together to try and achieve both price stability and inflation, as well as a long-term plan uh, for growth. So I think that possibly the Chancellor's plan um, would have worked at another time when inflation wasn't at double digits and the Bank of England was desperately trying to bring price levels back down to that 2% target. Yeah, Victoria, thank you very much indeed uh, for your expert opinion and uh, we'll see what emerges in these coming hours. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> so we've, heard, we've heard from about what the markets uh, think. We've heard from politicians. But what do the public think? Well, one pollster suggesting the Prime Minister is as unpopular as former Prime Minister John Major was after Black Wednesday. We'll be speaking to a pollster about public opinion. It's the only one that counts. First, it's your news update. Almost exactly 2.35, I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The Shadow Chancellor is calling on the Prime Minister to reverse the government's tax-cutting plans amid speculation over a possible mini-budget U-turn. Rachel Reeves' comments come after Tory members of the 1922 committee urged Liz Truss to reconsider the Chancellor's fiscal measures. Bank of England has intervened twice with an emergency support package. However, that support comes to an end tomorrow. The High Court is hearing a second challenge against the government's plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. The government says the measures would reduce numbers crossing the English Channel. Critics are concerned by Rwanda's human rights record, though. Charity Asylum Aid, who've brought the challenge, say tight timescales lead to unfairness and impact people's ability to access justice. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has risen to a new record high. Figures released by NHS England show 7 million were waiting at the end of August. That's up from 6.8 million in July. It's the highest number since records began in 2007. Royal Mail workers are striking today in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The Communication Workers Union says 115,000 members are on picket lines outside Royal Mail offices. It's the first of 19 walkouts planned for the coming months. Royal Mail says industrial action is weakening the financial position of the company. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Back to Mark and Gloria in just a moment. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. 
where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. The government have had a difficult time since that mini budget, not just from the markets, but the opinion polls have been pretty dire. Is it recoverable? How significant are those uh, Labour leads? Well, we can speak now to Joe Twyman, who is the co-founder and director of Delta Poll. Joe, good of you to join us. So these good afternoon. 30, these thirty-point leads, they don't sort of ring true. But what do, what do you make? of those 30-point Labour leads and how much is it to do with Labour and how much is, is it to do with the difficulty that the government find themselves in? Well, inevitably, of course, it's a combination of both to some degree, but certainly I think this is a reflection of a particularly bad period for the Conservative Party and a particularly good period for Labour. Labour is off the back of the spotlight of publicity it got through its, uh, through its conference and, uh, and that was relatively well received by the public. In contrast, the Conservative Party had quite a difficult conference with talk of uh, divisions and rifts between even senior cabinet ministers. And then, of course, all the turmoil around the markets and the, uh, and the mini budget causing difficulty in the polls further. And so, what we see is a reflection of uh, is a reflection of that, uh, and the leads are significant. That's uh, that's certainly the, certainly the case. But what we don't know is how long it will last. Twenty point leads and over twenty point leads are not completely unknown. Uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of years ago, the Conservatives had a twenty point more than a twenty point lead over Labour during the COVID pandemic. But of course, that was a very unusual situation. Whereas now. What we're seeing is far more quote unquote normal times, but also the underlying data for it being very bad news for the Conservatives, whether it's Liz Truss's personal ratings or the ratings of the party on management of the economy. It's all pointing in the wrong direction. And, and, and this is a key question, of course. Is it policy or is it personality? Clearly, the mini budget has not gone down well. But is there also an element suggesting that uh, Liz Truss is, um, well, not Boris Johnson as far as Tory uh, voters are concerned? Well, certainly, uh, certainly, she's not Boris Johnson in terms of uh, in terms of her ratings, and Boris Johnson's ratings were extremely poor. But now you have a situation where nearly three quarters of people believe that Liz Truss is doing a bad job, and that includes nearly six out of ten people who voted Conservative at the last election. Compare that with nearly half of people who think that Keir Starmer is doing a good job, and it really emphasises the difference between the two. So in personalities, it's not particularly good news. In terms of general attitudes to policies, we see that by a margin of more than two to one, people think that Labour are the best party to deal with the economy and indeed with the cost of living. Or you could look at specific policies, and, uh, and you see if you, when you go through the mini-budget uh, announcements, you can see that those, while some of those policies, such as the freeze on on, uh, freeze on energy prices were popular. Many, most notably the, uh, the abolition of the top rate of income tax, were very unpopular, with fewer than one in five people supporting them. And looking forward, expectations for the economy are very poor as well, with fewer than one in five people expecting that the, co the economy will actually grow in the next 12 months, despite that being such a point of emphasis for the Prime Minister and her right. cabinet. Um, John, you, you know, as we speak to you, there is suggestions we might be getting another U-turn on corporation tax. Uh, the Chancellor has been speaking in Washington, where he's been meeting with the IMF, uh, saying his total focus is on delivering on the mini-budget uh, in response to speculation on, on these U-turns. What, what does the polling tell us about his position as well? Because quite clearly, uh, when they came in, it was you know, a, a, a double act that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister were intertwined. Yes, and, uh, and in the same way that they were seen as a double act uh, coming in, they're now seen as a double act in terms of the polling. And, and the results for, uh, for uh, his own personal rating, Kwasi Kwarteng's personal rating, are very close to those of, of Liz Truss's. And so uh, this is a problem that they both suffer from. And really, it's not so much to do with specific uh, specific policies. I mean, for instance, 40% of people supported the, uh, the position on corporation tax in the mini-budget. Uh, but it's about the general feeling, the broad narratives people have 
about uh, about whether the government can do the right thing, whether the government can operate competently, and whether the com uh, whether the government is doing what's best for Britain. And on many of those measures, the uh, the Chancellor specifically and the Conservative Party generally fall down very badly. Joe Twyman from Delta Poll, founder of Delta Poll, thank you very much for your insights. It's quite extraordinary what's happening right now, uh, Mark, isn't it? We know that Liz Truss, uh, because we are being briefed by Downing Street, journalists are being briefed by Downing Street, that they are sitting down and working out whether and how to U turn on the budget with corporation tax uh, being the most uh, likely. A change um, from the mini budget. Meanwhile, the Chancellor in Washington saying that uh, his total focus is on delivering the measures that were announced in that mini budget. Quite extraordinary. Yeah, the Atlantic's quite wide, of course. We'll see if it comes together a little bit in the coming hours and we'll keep you updated, our uh, correspondents and reporters uh, across events in Washington, in well, Washington and Westminster for you. We'll update you as we get more on that. But let's uh, also reflect on the government saying it's now down to Buckingham Palace to decide whether the controversial Kohinoor diamond should be used uh, in the coronation of Camilla, Queen Consort, along with King Charles. The gem was the star feature of the Queen Mother's coronation crown and was made for the 1937 ceremony. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's governing party is said to be concerned that the diamond, which was given to Queen Victoria by the East India Company in the 19th century, would revive unwelcome memories of the British Empire. Well, the options said to include removing the diamond or the Queen Consort could opt for another crown altogether for uh, that ceremony. Let's get the views of broadcaster and historian David Starkey, of course, who was at our side for uh, the Queen's funeral. And when we saw uh, the, the scepter, the orb and the crown, all those important um, elements of, of the monarchy on display, David, what was your take on the suggestion that um, they may go for, well, some would say, an inferior crown? Well, it would be an inferior crown. The crown of the Queen Consort is one of the two most beautiful crowns in the entire collection. It's a stunning, wonderful piece of jewellery. And indeed, in a naughty moment, I'd rather like to wear it myself. It is, it is staggering. It will be a terrible shame not to use it. Um, I think also what we need to do, we need to reverse all of this debate. Um, we've got, yes, the, the jewel in the crown is a product of the British Empire in India. But just look at the background to it. It originally, as far as we know, its original fame is that it's in the peacock throne of the Mughal emperor in Delhi. Now, the Mughal emperor in Delhi is Islamic. He is, he is Mohammedan, whereas, of course, the new regime, the, the, the regime in India now, is passionately Hindu nationalist. So there's absolutely no connection. And then what happens to this wonderful stone? Well, the uh, the uh, Mughal emperor, the, the Islamic emperor, is conquered by the Shah of Persia. And the jewel is taken off to what is now what was then the Persian Empire, which is now somewhere in Afghanistan. And then there's another coup and a Sikh emperor, uh, temporarily based in Lahore, which is Pakistan, conquers it back from the Persian emperor. Do you see what I mean? It's this extraordinary ebb and flow. In other words, India is a product of repeated empires, and we are only the last and the greatest there that gives it its modern formation. The, the controversy, of course, is the fact that the, the critics say it was actually effectively seized by the East India Company back in 1849, even though uh, the 10-year-old uh, Maharaja, Dayup Singh, uh, ceded it. Uh, you know, the critics say, well, actually, he was forced to give it away, effectively. Well, equally, of course, every one of those shifts of ownership that I've talked about was a result of seizure, and it was also usually the result of conquest, massacre, and mutilation. The British one is positively marked, tame, and gentle. So I think we should throw all this back to India. Remember, what we have in the crown jewels is another wonderful, wonderful crown that is really the twin of that 1937 crown. It's the crown that's made for George V, for the king's uh, great-grandfather, um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, back in, in 1911, for the Delhi Durbar, which is really the beginning of modern India. It's a wonderful, wonderful crown. I think what we should do to the Indian government is say, can we stop this tit-for-tat? 
Can we work with you to create a proper museum of the Indian Raj in Delhi that tells all the sides of the story? We will return this magnificent crown that is the symbol of the first the British Raj and what is now the state of India, the, 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 the new subcontinent of India. We made it. You were there. We yeah. want to work together to tell the story truthfully. We've got, we've got to stop being at the mercy of these false okay. narratives. And we need to take the initiative. David Starkey, thank you for another crowning moment here on GB Newsday. And uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks very much indeed. Now, it's not just Liz Truss who's facing disagreements in her ranks. Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, he enjoyed a remarkably united party conference last month, but still tensions remain over relations with the trade unions who have long provided funding to Labour. I sat down with the former General Secretary of Unite, Len McCluskey, to find out what he thinks of Sir Keir and why he still supports Jeremy Corbyn. This is Len McCluskey's Life and Times. <laughs> Redlen, the most influential trade union leader in a generation. You didn't just have a big influence in the Labour movement, also in the Labour Party too. Keir Starmer, did you, did you have many dealings with him? Can you tell us, can you tell people who are watching anything about what he's like? <laughs> well, of course, it was COVID, if you recall. Mm. Um, you didn't well, back him, did you? No, you, we you backed, backed Rebecca. Uh, Becky, Becky Long Bailey, we backed, as you know, Keir. Well, there was three candidates. In fact, in some ways, it was a, a justification, a vindication of Corbynism, because three candidates ran for the leadership, uh, Becky, Lisa and Andy, and uh, Keir. And all three of them ran on what was regarded as a Corbynesque platform. Keir, in particular, had 10 points that he ran on. But the day, he, he ran a brilliant campaign. The other two campaigns weren't as good as they should have been, um, especially Becky's. And the fact of the matter is, the day before he was elected, and we, we didn't know the result, but I knew he'd won, I rang him, and I said, look, Keir, you're going to win. I need you to understand that Unite and Len McCluskey uh, we'll give you all the support. You shouldn't see us as an enemy. And he said, oh, Len, I don't. We had a very long conversation. Um, and subsequent to that, he said to me at the time, look, I'm going to keep Jeremy's forum with the trade unions open, but I want a personal channel of communication with you. And uh, he did that. And uh, I had a number of conversations with him. Uh, all positive, but then, strangely enough, his actions uh, seemed to go against what he was telling me about. My team used to say to me, he's taking the Michael out of you. He says these things that you report back to us, but then he does this or he does that. Now, of course, he then uh, did the worst thing possible and he suspended Jeremy Corbyn, the previous leader from the party. I personally went to see him, along with John Tricky. We met him, Morgan McSweeney and Angie, um, Angie Rayner. When was this? Uh, literally a day or so, a day, the 30th of October. Uh, literally a day after he'd suspended Jeremy. And um, I, uh, cut a long story short, uh, he said he didn't want an internal war. And if Jeremy would agree a particular statement, <coughs> then we'd all get back to normal. He'd be, he'd, be, he'd, he'd be back in. So a statement was put together by, um, by his team, um, uh, Simon Fletcher and Morgan McSweeney, uh, John Trickett. Uh, it was uh, delivered to me the following day. I spoke to McSweeney and I said, look, uh, you're speaking on behalf of Kia. Kia wants this. Yes, yes, yes. We then persuaded Jeremy to accept the statement. Um, and as you know, the process produced a unanimous decision from the NEC panel to, uh, uh, to, to lift the suspension on Jeremy and bring him back into the fold. And that night, uh, Kia withdrew the whip. Absolutely disgraceful. It was at that moment that I lost any trust in Keir Starmer. Uh, the man's a liar. And um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, people have said to me, well, you know, why did you lose trust? I've been a negotiator all my life. And when you cut a deal 
uh, with somebody. If I cut a deal with an employer and they then renege on that deal, the trust is obviously broken and vice versa. Do you think Jeremy should stand as an independent? Ah, well, I, I personally do, without a shadow of a doubt. Cause, I mean, the idea that he's been suspended and his constituents love him. In essence, that's what he is. I mean, he was thrust into the into the centre, as you know, uh, of, of leadership. Um, but in essence, it's his constituency. He has loved the, you know, he walks around the streets, he knows people. And so, yeah, I think he absolutely should run again. So new generation of union leaders, lots of them women, but I detect a different um, method in engagement. Not so interested in the Labour Party. Um, and I, I don't know whether you think that's, that's a mistake or if you would have any advice for them, but they, I don't feel like I'd, I, I would be asking the many of the current crop how they deal with the Labour leadership. We were so, so integral to all of the Labour leadership. That's how it felt to us. Yeah, well, that's because I'm a great believer that you cannot separate uh, industrial life and indeed life in general from politics. Politics dictates everything we do. Everything we do is dictated by politics. Now, as the largest affiliate to the Labour Party, I've seen it as my job to try and influence uh, the leaderships, whether that be Ed or Jeremy or Kia. And that was a task that I set out to do with, of course, the full support of my executive. Where do these waiver strikes end? How do they stop? Should they stop? Where, what's, the, what's the end goal? Because well, obviously, the cost of living crisis is, is happening. It's dead interesting to me that um, the public, uh, historically, who may have been anti-strike, that anti-strike, anti-trade union is simply not there. You know, it's a fact of life that when public sector workers, service workers, whether in the public sector or the private sector, when they take strike action, it affects ordinary innocent people. It's why the Tories have attacked it's, um, the RMT and, and ASLEF and TSSA, because they think the public are on their side but it's proved that that's not the case. And here's the real problem. Employers at the moment, if I cast my mind back 18 months ago, when inflation was one, one and a half, two percent, uh, employers in wage negotiations may have been offering one percent. And workers, and this is a historical mm. thing, I've, I've lived through this all my life, would sometimes think, well, what's the point of going on strike for 1%? Who cares, you know? And the, 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 the moods, there was still strikes, of course, there was lots, but not in the, as at the current climate. What's happened now? Employers are still locked in a time warp of 18 months ago. And so they're offering 2 and 3% mm. pay rises when inflation is 10%. And that's why workers quite rightly say, well, we may as well have a go because it's worth having a go. If we're offering 3% and we end up getting 8%, mm. well, it's worth it. Final question. You are a negotiator. Uh, you said that earlier, that you're a trained negotiator. You wouldn't have just dealt with Labour figures. We've talked a lot about the Labour Party. Of course, you would have dealt with government ministers. You would have negotiated with them. Who was the person you most... Um, you had the best relationship with out of the out of the Tories and perhaps the most challenging. Oh, right. Well, certainly, um, I don't know whether I'd do him any favour because I kind of mentioned him in my book, but Greg uh, Clark, who was the business secretary, I had a very good relation with him. I thought he was a decent man. Um, he was the only Tory that kind of got the need for government intervention in industry. And we did some good work together, in particular in, in the car industry. Um, you're right, I met a whole plethora of government ministers because, of course, that was my job to try and influence them. Um, uh, challenging individuals, well, a, a number of them were challenging, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one. That, and when I met Philip Hammond, who was the chancellor, his, um, he had with him Liz Truss, and I was meeting, uh, I was meeting the Chancellor on zero hours contract, saying how disgraceful 
how inhumane they were and how uh, he, they should be abolished. Um, and he kind of tried to defend it. Oh, no, some people like it. And I said, who? Who likes zero hour contracts? And he looked at Liz and said, Liz, do you want to tell then? And she then uh, proceeded to um, uh, speak to me about zero hour contracts. I must say I was deeply, deeply unimpressed. And I said, who the hell have you been speaking to? Some Cambridge students who think it's jolly hockey sticks to work in a bar on a Saturday afternoon. And she said, oh, I could bring, I could bring people uh, to meet you who like zero hour contracts. And I said, for everyone you bring, I'll bring 100,000 who don't, who want to be treated decently as employees. So uh, that, I think, is my only meeting with Liz Trust. And she did not impress me and at the moment. Oh, my dear, I, I, I've never seen anything like it, to be fair to her. Len McCluskey, uh, Red Len, massive figure in trade union politics and labour politics in our generation. Thank you. Thank you. You can watch the full interview with Red Len on our YouTube channel. Coming up next, Patrick Christus live with uh, the very latest on uh, what appears to be a growing crisis once more at Westminster on the mini-budget. Let's take a short break, though. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, 